music. It's not just part of our daily lives, it's part of our wrestling fandom as well, and it has been for decades. That's where this show comes in, Music of the Mat, the podcast devoted exclusively to the music of pro wrestling, hosted by Andrew Rich. Hey, that's me. Each episode delivers a different topic with a variety of great guests, fun conversations, musical analysis, and of course, a heartfelt pun or two. New episodes drop every other Tuesday on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or your podcast app of choice. Check out Music of the Mat only on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. Hello, welcome back everyone to the Gentleman's Wrestling Podcast. I am your host, as always, Jesse Collings. And joining me today, a very special first-time guest, someone who has been uh this this is this is about a year in the making, I feel like, uh his appearance on the show, but he's coming to us live from the green and lovely lanes of the Emerald Isle. It's Alan Forel. Alan, welcome to the show. Yeah, I've been begging Jesse for a year. I've been like, let me, I'm a, I'm a gentleman. Trust me, I promise you, I'm a gentleman. Jesse's like, I'm not sure you're that gentlemanly. I need to see more. And I've spent the last year just doing, helping, helping old ladies cross the street, um, helping people reach for high things in the supermarket when they can't reach them. Just doing everything I can to show that I'm a gentleman. Um, and he. Uh, apparently accepted that uh, that i am and i finally got the invite so it's a, it's a great honor yeah it is like a, we had to do a, a big background check uh on your ethnic background to make sure that you were a, a proper gentleman because we're, we're like one of those clubs you know yep yep i started uh i started what is the term uh dotting my hat uh dotting my cap uh like timothy thatcher does whenever he greets people um <laughs> well i i don't think he does it for but he always does it for uh um, I believe he always does it for women because he every time he uh, sees myself and my wife um, when we've gone to Germany over the years, we'll go up and say hey, hi to Tim and uh, he will, uh, I'll always be excited. I'll be like, hey, Tim, and I'll be going to take his hand and he's like, ladies first. And he'll like take his hat off because he's always wearing like an old grimy like battle arts hat or something like that. And he'll take it off and he'll like shake Sarah's hand and uh, um yeah, and then uh, that's why uh, that's why like when you go to Germany, like every usually like by the end of the weekend, every woman in the in Oberhausen just adores Timothy Thatcher because he is the most gentlemanly in a like non creepy way, which is amazing to say for a wrestler, especially an independent wrestler around those years, but just the most effortlessly gentlemanly nice man and uh yeah i'm i'm not quite at that level yet but uh i think i've I've done enough to earn my spot here on the show yeah i'm trying to think like what are some other things that one could do like i'm picturing i'm thinking like old english gentleman style like you could uh do one of the like we can we could have a fox hunt right they still do those uh i know you're irish but uh, they do uh do they do fox hunts is that still a thing I have no idea. I wouldn't consider it that gentlemanly, though. Or well, obviously not. Well, many that, <laughs> that's the irony of it, right? Was that? Uh... Yeah. I remember when I was a kid. Um, I remember. I I don't know who it was. I don't know. So maybe some of my dad's brothers or or something. Uh, I remember it being on my dad's side of the family, and I remember there was a pheasant hunt going on. I was like, huh. Okay, that's <laughs> that stuck with me. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I think um, yeah, fox something I've never I've never come across. Uh, I can't say we do get a lot of foxes around here. As uh, uh, as my wife's not from Dublin, um, so she, when she moved up here, she uh was taken aback by how many um dirty city foxes, as she termed them, uh, were would wander around the place at night. Um, I've always just kind of been been used to that. Often, yeah, I mean, I would I would gladly take your foxes uh, for my coyotes because we have coyotes everywhere. Um, Ooh. 
that uh, people have a rash, I guess, like irrational fear of the coyote, like the coyote is going to attack them. When I think like I, there's like three coyote attacks on a human like per year in the entire country. Um, but people see a coyote and I think it's like a, you know, like a Bengal tiger or something like that. And they alert everyone. There was a coyote. I saw it in the yard. It's like, yeah, they they live around here. Unless you unless you have a small dog or you let your cat out, you shouldn't really be concerned about a coyote. But people are. Um Anyway, we're not here to talk about uh, varmints or uh, or uh, uh, Alan getting a Boy Scout badge for helping an old woman across the street. Um, we're here to talk about Japan. And particularly, we're here to talk about kind of what we're looking at Japan headed into 2024 and the direction that some of the larger promotions are going in and kind of what trends we are seeing. And I figured we would start, we would go over several promotions and We'll start with one promotion, Alan. I'm going to let you choose a promotion to talk about. Yeah, so um, I, I I'm very interested to uh, just as an overarching thing, like I'm I'm very interested to talk about the scene um coming into this year because I think it's very there's a lot of interesting things going going on and there's a lot of different directions things could go on a promotion by promotion basis and the overall scene. And um, I think one of the main things that's particularly interesting and, and something that we'll hone in on a lot during the show is the sort of next wave of, of young stars, some guys that have been around for a couple of years, guys that are just starting to break through and how the different directions they could go and um, who's kind of likely going to emerge as the real kind of next stars to carry the industry if anyone does um so that's going to be a, a, an interesting part of this conversation i think and uh i think um i think i'd like to start talking about all japan jesse um i just uh, released a new episode of progress paradise where i um uh, talked about kind of some of the big matches from the, f the first week of the the year and what what I really enjoyed and stuff like that and uh, I I did talk a bit about um the all Japan WWE Simon and Oki stuff and it was kind of my first time talking about it because I all through kind of the New Year's and Christmas when everyone was firing off their takes and things were reporting things were being reported my my stance was always kind of like this is way too uh, there, there's there's way too much um uh, unknown factors going on here and also you're dealing with language barriers and the news from a different country and stuff like that. there's way too many question marks here to be to not take a stance of just I'm going to wait and see what happens and so that was the stance and everything that I took I was like I'm just going to hold back. I'm not going to fire off any thoughts on this, but I think we've seen enough now to at least have an idea, a, a better idea of what's going on than we maybe did three, three, four weeks ago. And uh, for, for, for those that aren't aware, what basically seems to be happening is you've got... I don't want to use the word turmoil. That's probably too strong a word, but you've got situations going on with All Japan Pro Wrestling. Um, and there's a couple of different things happening at the same time, which in some ways are linked, but more, more so than not, they're independent of each other. They just happen to be going on at the same time. And you see different dynamics in terms of reactions where you've got like a Western coverage and, and fan reaction of, oh my God, WWE is coming in. We don't want to see anything uh, like we saw in Europe or the US Indies with, with WWE coming in and encroaching on all Japan. And you've also got the Western, uh, and that's kind of coming from like Japanese wrestling fans in the West. But then you've got the kind of more sort of WWE fans or, or maybe even sort of wrestling media approach, which is more, oh, isn't this cool? WWE NXT star going to all Japan and wrestling for the Triple Crown. How cool. So you've got those kind of different things from the West. 
and in Japan, there doesn't seem to be that much concern about a potential WWE All Japan relationship. It's it's not. It doesn't seem to be that big of a deal to fans in Japan. The fans in Japan seem to be way more concerned about Katsuhiko Nakajima being the Triple Crown champion and channeling all this Antonio Inoki stuff, which, based on the, the bubble we're in and, and fans in the West, generally people are loving that and thinking it's awesome. And it's hard to decipher in terms of the local reaction how much of that is kind of turn off and how much of it is good heat and it's working really well and i think the returns in terms of the business all japan is doing seem to show that it's it's good heat and it's working as a story and from a creative and product point of view it's absolutely working because honestly i think what all japan did over the course of December and into January with Katsuhiko Nakajima, I think it's the best thing in wrestling currently. Um, I'm enjoying the hell out of it. I think his whole aura, his matches, just outstanding. Um, So it's like the Japanese fans are really concerned about one thing happening. The Western fans really concerned about another thing happening. And then you've got this president in the middle of it all who, in a lot of the talk about this, has been discussed as if he's this new guy that's just come into the mix and he's he's like he's bringing in a, the WWE to take over and, and all this kind of stuff. There's all this stuff said about him that's quite inaccurate because in, he's actually been there since like 2018, I believe. And he saw them through the pandemic, which was like a really tough time for all Japan, um, in particular, well, the whole Japanese wrestling industry, but all Japan in particular, especially in 2022, was really feeling the delayed effects of the pandemic more than a lot of promotions. They had a really rough 2022, but they turned things around in 2023 or a combination of turning things around because Tajiri left and he was he, Tajiri was a big part of the, the the booking and the creative process for for all Japan and there was a lot of issues there Tajiri's never really been good in that role never a success and he he left and then a lot of the younger core group of guys who had been slowly getting built up a lot of the focus went on them and they really took hold in 2023 and the product was great all japan had a great 2023 yeah and they've come um, in with this addition of nakajima and they have so much potential for 2024 so it's there's like a lot of good things happening but it's like there's a lot of miss uh, a lot of stuff is misunderstood um and i don't even fully understand it myself because like i don't understand the dynamics between because it's all so in-house like i don't know what the dynamics are between president fukuda and shuji shikawa who's apparently now uh leaving the company or takawa mori who has left the company um and suwama who's still there and clearly a big influence but is he on the president's side do they see things in the same way where does kendo miyahara stand and all this now that he's got a big um backstage position all we can do is speculate and the speculation is kind of hollow because what do we really know unless we're there or have connections and pretty much none of us do um to what's going on back because like that's the thing with japanese wrestling in particular it's really hard to find out and know really what the dynamics are because for like anyone in the West, because at best you're going to get a connection to maybe a, a foreign wrestler who spends time over there. But the thing is the foreign wrestlers, they're not let into the dynamics of like, they're usually kept at fairly big arms length. And if you talk to a foreign wrestler from any Japanese company, it's like they're almost speculating because they don't really know about what goes on. And that's always kind of been the way 
Yeah, so, I remember in uh, Stan Hansen's book, he writes about how, like, even though he was this huge, huge, huge star for All Japan, this, like, legendary All Japan wrestler, like, he basically admitted, he's like, I don't really know what happens behind the scene. Like, you just, if you're a, if you're a foreign wrestler, you're just never going to be a part of, you know, that kind of a company. Stan in Hansen a way. erupting on Doug Furness for injuring Masawa in 1995 in the champion carnival and misawa bringing doug furnace into his locker room and doug furnace thinking he was going in getting fired and when he walks in and they shut the door behind him and misawa takes off the neck brace and then spins his neck around and shows that it was total work and he wasn't injured and then like doing the shush motion so that like Doug Ferguson didn't beat himself up too much and like Stan Hansen didn't know that and he yeah. was like he was like this legendary star in the promotion he's an icon guy. by that point yeah. yeah an icon exactly and and he was and then like apparently Doug Furness went back and was like no it's he's not really hurt and Stan Hansen was like first you injure him and now you lie about it what the <laughs> hell's wrong with you <laughs> uh, but, but uh, uh in in regards to like the, the whole WWE thing I do think like if you're a western fan you have WWE has this really well-earned reputation of being this like total parasitic company that if they get involved with your favorite non-wwe company it's generally not a good thing for your chosen company and certainly there are are recent examples in europe that can that i can totally tell you uh that a lot of fans are probably reacting towards and here's the argument i would i would place against that and i am the when WWE were, were sticking their claws into Europe and and the U.S. Indies, I was as um like I was aware of what was going on and speaking out against what was going on as much as anybody. I saw it for what it was. I didn't try to trick myself into thinking anything else. It was this is a spade is a spade, and we have history and we know what they're doing and. It was abundantly clear what their plan was. However, when it comes to Japan and Mexico, they've never really been able to do that. And they have tried. And they've tried they've tried to have relationships with promotions. They've tried to bully their way into taking the market share for their own promotion. And it's never really caught on because Mexico and Japan have their own wrestling culture and wrestling scene that has roots. And it's not as easy for WWE to get in there and pull out those roots where in the UK, particularly what they did in 2016, 2017, you were going into a wrestling scene which basically is run by model laughter proliferated with wrestlers fans uh, owners of companies who were all brought up on wwe Mm -hmm. and all viewed wwe as like they basically rolled over and died and welcomed wwe to come in and oh my god here's here's william regal oh i'm gonna roll over and let him rub my belly and uh, take whatever he wants from me um and regal will go in and charm them and and you know some guys your jim smallman's and stuff got jobs out of it um others uh, like uh, and like promotions basically turned into shells of themselves um it, it, there was a few promote a few people who who like an Andy Quilden um who basically said okay who listened to them but then were basically like well why is this good for me how does this help my business um and i think we see with japanese wrestling a a bigger version of of Andy Quilden in that they'll listen to the they'll they'll you know, WWE make approaches or moves or whatever, 
but ultimately they'll say okay but how does this help my business how does this help us and i think that's where it will come to with, with all japan and i think that's um and just to give some of the historical examples i i referred to like WB in the 90s a couple of times tried to broker stuff with with all japan then with baba um nothing ever really went anywhere they tried with sws that never really went anywhere they tried on the smaller level with with smaller promotions like michinoku pro um and they did end up getting a few guys from michinoku pro but like in the grand scheme of things i don't think that was all that big of a, of a deal um and go like then like when they went when they tried to get into japan in recent years and, and apparently made like offers for stardom or noah or whatever they were just rebuffed because like these promotions are owned by or a lot of them are owned by very big corporate backers and it it, it didn't make sense and the Japanese business mindset will be very like they're not going to be as as um, stars in their eyes over William Regal talking to them as the owners of Progress were. Um, they're going to look at it from a, a business point of view, and I I think as well you have the dynamic now on the WWE side where you have an ownership which is all about making sense from a business perspective that's what we see from like more like more vocally than i would have expected more calling a spade a spade than i would have expected you see these endeavor guys being very open about like cuts they want to make and things they want to scrap and it's very clear that they view this as a business and want to run it as a business and they're only doing what makes sense from a business point of view whereas vince mcmahon was as driven by ego and grudges as he was what made sense from a business point of view and well, the, i think the, the general consensus was everyone has seen like the, the the paul levesque meme where he's talking about nxt and like you know all these different places nxt europe nxt india nxt middle east nxt south america nxt japan and when the kind of the Endeavor purchase happened, really since Nick Khan has kind of become a more forceful figure in WWE, one of the things has been, oh, well, they'll never do these NX, these regional NXTs because NXT now doesn't make money. It probably will make money once the new TV deal starts, but they couldn't even turn a profit on NXT America. You think they're going to be able to turn a profit on all these other NXTs in other parts of the world? They're just going to be huge, uh, you know, money sinks for wwe and they're not going to really it, it'd be very hard to sell them as a long-term investment i would think to uh, to skeptical uh business executives and stockholders and japan's a really difficult place to do business because it's such a different business culture over there do you mm -hmm. remember when ufc bought pride and their initial intention was they're going to restart pride in japan they're going to run it as this very much like wwe and wcw when, when WF when they bought WCW and they're going to run it as its own promotion and and it, within like six months Dana White was like so pissed off about how awkward he, from his point of view the Japanese people were to do business with and how he viewed it as them making things difficult when maybe there was a little bit of that but mostly it was probably just cultural differences and him not knowing how to operate in that environment and it is a very challenging environment. And if you're a Nick Khan, it's like, how is that worthwhile? Um, if there's no, like, I think where this will end up going, I think the extent of what we'll see with WWE is this, because William Regal and, and so his son um, was in the New Japan Dojo. A lot of people don't know that. Uh, he was in the New Japan Dojo. He spent time in WXW Academy. He did the rounds for a couple of, uh, uh, I don't say a couple of years, but the guts of 18 months, I would say, before kind of the pandemic. Um, he was going around different places, learning pro wrestling. And um, I, I think Regal 
views Japan as a place that he thinks is a great place to learn the proper, a lot of the proper fundamentals of pro wrestling. I think he respects the Japanese wrestling scene a hell of a lot more than he respected the UK indie scene. <laughs> he viewed the UK indie scene as unsafe. Um, he viewed it as um, just a bad environment. Uh, in, in, in a lot of ways, he was probably proven right. But he he thought they could go in there and make a a UK scene in the W oh, like handled by WWE that was more professional um, and just better for talent and better for fans. And that's what he wants to do with NXT UK. Um, but I think he is approaching Japan with the mindset of this is a good place already, a place I respect. And I think what he'll want to use it for is to send guys to get experience there like we've just seen with his son and i think he'll probably also want to keep an eye on who some of the good young wrestlers are and in japan and then maybe take them back to WWE. that's where i would have some concern i would have some concern that he lays his eyes on yuma anzai and is like oh you need this guy but I don't see WWE making a lot of hires from Japan when it, they've got such a full deck in terms of in terms of like their roster and their performance center and um yeah I just I and I don't see a lot of those hires working out because they've hired so many Japanese wrestlers in the last couple of years and it just never seems to it just never seems to really work out guys have just ended up yeah, going back and what is yuma and zai like say in two years he signs with wwe like you think that he's going to get like this giant push and get over to a huge degree with wwe fans the way that product is now yeah of course like, that's... Not. he's he's got so many extra as talented as he is he's got so many extra hurdles to overcome than your average Joe in the performance center because he is having to learn a new language, having to um, acclimatize to a new culture in America. Um, and you've got he's, these, and, and he's going to have to learn a new style to, to work with all the style, WWE people. Essentially. Yeah. He's basically learning from scratch a new style in the same way that uh, a high level, um, athlete that they recruit from college is learning the style of the WWE style of pro wrestling from from scratch and and doing what they want guys to do and talk how they want guys to talk and present themselves like they want to present themselves um like it's just like he's going to end up being behind a um is Tr Trick Williams is the name of the guy, right? That people think has a, a is a big prospect in NXT, who's sure, like this yeah. great great athlete that apparently is like looks like a star, carries himself like a star. I, I hear about him quite quite a bit, and it's like, how is Yuma Anzai going to be surpass like a, a Trick Trick Williams? Whereas in Japan, Yuma Anzai has a lot of room for growth because he is a he is a prodigy. Japanese wrestling and I yeah I just I don't know I just don't see them gathering up a load of Japanese wrestlers because I don't think it's in their interest I don't think they're they have the plans to use them and I think if someone like Regal kind of thought about it logically and I think he is a logical thinker in terms of his needs and what he views as WWE's needs, I think he would probably think it's better have these guys stay where they are and keep this scene strong so that we can send our guys there to get better. I I think that's going to be their ultimate... I, I think that's what they see as the... Because I don't think they, they expect or... I don't think they think they'll have the backing of Endeavor to make any bigger play than that in a country like Japan. 
Um, so I think what they'll see it as an opportunity to do is simply just use it as a system for sending their guys over and having their guys learn a, a, a new style, add some, and it's something that even though it may not be advantageous to the guys in the NXT WWE system, it's something that Regal personally values because it's the advice he gave to everyone. Like Anthony Bowens, when he was like doing tryouts um, before AEW, he was told by Regal, oh, you've got this, that, and the other going for you, but you really need to go and, and tour Japan and uh, or become a star. Um, that well, way can i just say with with regal like and i and i heard i think i read it in the observer which was the idea of the reason that charlie dempsey which is who's regal's son who wrestled uh nakajima uh the big new year's show this yeah. year um like i think dave wrote something like you know regal really wants his son to gain like global experience and wants him to wrestle in japan and i was just thinking you know there's a really easy way for regal to get his son global experience and that would be to have him not in the warehouse in florida for the last two years and have them not signed to wwe um so this there's, there's just this annoying annoying like carny aspect of it which is like oh on one hand regal's like you got to go to japan to learn the proper style but at the other hand he's just you know this wwe hatchet man and there's this whole element of the performance center nxt that i just don't really understand where they make a big they made a big show over the years of oh we're going to bring in Johnny Saints and oh we're going to bring in like this guy from Mexico and we're going to bring in all these like famous legendary wrestlers from around the world and they're going to give seminars on how to be a star and it's this real global universal pan wrestling kind of educational atmosphere but we all know that NXT is is all about learning this very rigid, outdated WWE style of looking at the hard camera and doing very basic moves and totally uh, unnatural and not at all similar to all of this global wrestling that they are, are allegedly trying to teach. It just seems to be a total disconnect between this image of oh we want to build this performance center and have all the greatest minds from around the world come here but really we're just going to teach them like this very uh mechanical pre-approved vince mcmahon designed here, wrestling here's, system here's what i think where i think that that comes from jesse and i totally agree, agree with you on that analysis here's where i think here's how we compare it okay so this is probably a terrible analogy but it's the best one i can think of on the fly um I was trying to co come up with something uh, meal related as my analogy, but I, it didn't land for me. So I've got, I've got uh, this is the one I'll go with. So you work as a reporter, okay? So I, I don't know too much of the details in terms of what you do in your your day to day job, but just say, as a reporter, you're the company you work for. They tell you your job is to report on, um the local political scene what's happening in politics and um that is what you need to do you need to report on this election and you need to um th this is this is what we want from you this is why we, we pay you and you're fine with that and that's your your bread and butter that's what you do but you also have a passion for writing about um uh the local um some local uh cultural or arts thing that, that happens in your area and they don't necessarily want that from you but you enjoy doing it so you make some time to um ha write some articles about this arts thing that's going on in your area in addition to the political stuff and they don't mind you doing it if it's not affecting your main work that they want you to do and you keep doing it because you enjoy it i i think that's what you sorry just an awful analogy but i think it, you get the gist regal has this value and a lot of people there i i am using regal in a solo sense, but I'm honestly, when I use his name, I'm thinking of a lot of people there. Like I'm thinking of 
there's there's a core of like-minded people within the staff and within the wrestler slash staff like a drew gulak for example who value that kind of stuff that ultimately isn't actually going to feed into the production system but they enjoy being around it having they enjoy having a johnny saint there they enjoy bringing in a um uh, uh whether it's like a, an older wrestler or or, or wh- what have you just like they almost enjoy pretending it's something that it isn't yeah. and, and, and spending... Paul Levesque certainly falls into that category of like Paul Levesque somehow amongst some people has garnered this reputation of being like this huge uh like uh 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 the right word like this patron of the global wrestling and he just he loves all wrestling and he loves all styles and he loves wrestling from all over the world and all over times in history and maybe there's like a tiny kernel of truth to that but i've never understood why like paul levec is like this guy who's been with wwe for almost 30 years now who has learned under the hand of Vince McMahon for over 20 years um is is somehow like this this incredibly uh universal wrestling appreciator and not just this guy who's been in WWE for a trillion years and has a very rigid sense of what works and what doesn't. Yeah, no, I I think I think with Paul Levesque, he's basically driven by his own ego and wanting to be liked as much as anything else. Um uh but yeah, I think he trusts he trusts a regal and he trusts different guys he has in different positions to um to run their area of of things how they they see fit and mm. i don't think regal probably has to convince paul Levesque of a whole lot of things i think he's probably given kind of carte blanche to make the moves he wants to to make but whether they have any impact is uh, it, I I I I don't think they a lot of them will have impact, you know. Um, and I think that um, I think like going back to kind of your original point, which is kind of like the difference between the way Western fans view this kind of WWE involvement versus maybe Japanese fans. I think for Western fans, especially your puro Western fans, they have, you know, Japan has always been the safe space in terms of. This WWE, uh, whether it's WWE itself, like crushing other companies and competition or just WWE influencing other companies, um, you know, WWE's fingerprints are all over the wrestling landscape here in historically. It stands, Japan, on, it stands on its own two feet, Japanese yeah. wrestling. And historically, know? Japan has always been this refuge that was relatively untainted by WWE. Um so the idea for Western fans that WWE is attempting to, or maybe uh, perhaps sinking their teeth into a, an institution like All Japan Pro Wrestling, there's a lot of more panic that comes with that because they're like, oh no, now WWE is invading this place where I didn't think that they would previously really be able to gain much traction. Um, even if they ultimately don't gain that much traction and maybe their intent isn't even to gain that much traction there's that worry that comes up because the way that i think a lot of western fans have have viewed japan and that mentality doesn't exist in the same way in japan and amongst the japanese fans because they haven't you know been scarred by 40 years of wwe dominance having followed japanese wrestling closely for 20 years now guts off and knowing the history before that time pretty darn well at this stage, I am far less concerned about WWE turning Japanese wrestling on its head or turning it into something I don't want it to be. I'm far less concerned about that than I am about Japanese wrestling internally tearing itself apart oh, yeah. whether it's companies in within themselves or companies interacting with each other because i have far more historical examples jesse that i can point to 
of Japanese wrestling shooting itself in its own foot historically than I do of WWE successfully coming in and having an impact on Japanese wrestling. Because the latter just hasn't happened. And they've tried like so many times, like listening to Between the Sheets, they joke about uh, like covering like the 80s, like how often it comes up the WWE, like in the Observer or whatever, the WWE of big plans to uh, to start running shows in Japan and to uh, get on a TV network in Japan. I was like, it never amounted to anything, like all these wild stuff that they wanted to do in the 80s and, and then stuff that kind of has been lost to history because I didn't really know about it until I'd hear about it as a thing that was written in the Observer in like a 1986 Between the Sheets episode. Well, Dave was hired as a consultant by the WWF in the yeah. mid to late 80s. Yep. And they wanted him basically because they needed someone that could tell them about the Japanese market. Yep. And then in the 90s, it's more documented kind of what they did and what didn't work. And um, in the 2000s, they really left the scene itself alone but tried to like they did that raw in japan and stuff like that and the thing is when they do their own shows in japan the fans that typically go and the fans that typically watch WWE in japan aren't the same fans that go to a new japan show or a noah show like they have there's japanese in japan there's WWE fans and that number has gone up and down over the years but uh there's the re fans and then there's pro wrestling noah fans there's dragon gate fans there's the different companies kind of have their own fan bases and there isn't like a huge amount of crossover um so like i'm far more concerned about things like the turmoil we're seeing with people leaving all japan people making power plays um things we see with like pro wrestling noah over the years like the likes of keiji muto just ravaging that company japanese wrestling being stuck stuck in its ways a lot of the time like very stubborn and and a, a refusal to change and adapt and like ghetto for example is an extremely successful booker arguably the best booker of all time in terms of his peak years but i think a lot of his stubbornness and refusal to kind of you know adapt and change his formula i think that's a big problem for for new japan um but yeah i think there's a lot of issues within japanese wrestling like why do we see so many companies over the years splinter and break up into two companies and then those two companies break up into two companies over the a few years later and it's like none of that is good none of that is good for the scene um there's so many issues with within japanese wrestling and i probably don't even know of a lot of them like you know it's that is where there's the more historical examples of threats to the industry than um anything WWE would do from from the outside so yeah my, uh, my concern yeah. with WWE would be almost more is like a destabilizing um aspect of it which is if WWE money becomes involved or maybe one or two key stars get signed away um the kind of um a lot of the things that you were describing maybe become bigger and more likely to happen you know, further splintering of groups, companies, you know, losing some momentum. It's not necessarily like w we're going to get, you know, all Japan wrestling is going to become WWE Japan. And there's going to yeah. be like, it's going to just destroy the fabric of the company. But I do think WWE's involvement, much in a similar way to the UK scene, which would be, we're going to sign some of the bigger stars. We're going to kind and of- And AEW is there as well as a big problem in terms of signing, mm -hmm. um, like AEW and WWE being able to- yeah way out like they could basically if they wanted they could take any big star from japan by just throwing silly money at them or having a bidding war and, and like mm -hmm. that's what we saw with osprey in new japan we're just basically like look we can't there's no way we can compete I, for what I, you're yeah, gonna I get think offered in general i just think it's so and this has been the case this is not a recent phenomenon necessarily but it's so hard to keep a foreign wrestler for 
a super long time if they are being hotly pursued by either WWE yeah. or AEW. Just the, the travel to Japan alone. You basically have to be Zack Sabre Jr. where you live there, you love the culture, you don't want to leave, and you're happy within the company you work for. Um, and, but even wrestlers like Kenny Omega and Osprey, I would say, fit into that bill in terms of people who really enthusiastically embrace Japan and Kenny. Uh, had... Kenny, Kenny, yes, Osprey. I think he thought he did and liked the idea of it, but I, I think that, like, he moved back. Obviously, the pandemic came and there was issues that changed up a lot, but. Zach is very comfortable in, like, since his wife started working over there and um, um, just his personal life is very settled in Japan and yeah. has been for, for a number of years well, now. And it's... But, yeah, Zach aside, is it's kind of a, um, is a, a um, uh, I can't, and now I can't even remember the phrase, a exception that proves the rule. Um, it's it's just hard to compete with when when you're talking about flying to Japan for tours, and oh, it's brutal. And 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 because there's so much money between WWE and AEW, and you you tell these wrestlers even if they really like working in New Japan and love doing that, it just doesn't make sense. Especially and especially if you have a family and there's economic factors that come into play where you can just make so much money. Um, you know, wrestling United States now, uh, it can, it's, it's, it's going to be very difficult. And I think that's, uh, you know, going with Osprey now out of new Japan, you know, I think his, his, his neck, his last match is going to be a month from now. You're looking at, I mean, they, they're clearly looking at David Finley to be kind of their next top foreign wrestler. And to me, that's a pretty steep drop off. Um, and I think part of the reason that that is the case is because it's just, it's so hard to attract a foreign wrestler for a long period of time. Uh, now even that AEW, Finley, like I wouldn't, I wouldn't put any, even if Finley was knocking them dead, being awesome, like, um, which he's, he's clearly not, he's doing a decent job, but he's, he's not, he's not, a uh, wowing people. Um, he's in a very difficult was, position. Yeah, even if he was, like, I'd still be concerned because, like, he's got such a strong WWE connection with his father and his brother, and um, yeah, like it's uh, it's not a good environment right now to put a lot of stock in a in a foreign star. They need to be thinking homegrown because while it's still very possible you might lose a Yota Suji if he becomes a big star, or you might lose a Shota Amino if he becomes a big star, it's less likely just for the simple fact that they they're more they're gonna be more comfortable in Japan because it's where they've been brought up. It's they don't have to get on a plane to go there. They don't have to learn a new language. It's there's just a lot less of a likelihood than there would be for a Finley to, or if a, um, I don't know if, if Gabe kid caught on in a big way and became a breakout star this year for new Japan. Like it's, there's still a big likelihood that he could leave if he becomes a big enough star that both the big American companies want him. Um, and yeah, yeah so it's, I just uh, want to, um, I want to touch on all Japan, like for just a few quick things about all Japan's yeah. product. Um, I agree with you on Nakajima in terms of what he's been able to bring to that company. I think for me, my all Japan experience over the last six or seven years, um, really ever since Kento really took off as, as a individual star, the company had spent a really long time struggling to, I think, create adequate peers for Kento, where he was mostly wrestling and engaging with wrestlers from an, a different generation, like Suwama. Zeus, Shuji Ishikawa. Uh, right. These guys that were like a decade older than them or whatever. Yeah. And, it, you know, he was having really good matches. He was really entertaining, but he meant, and, and especially as those guys either left the company or started slowing down, 
it became apparent where it's like Kento is like two tiers above any of his peers. And it, that's it's becoming a problem because he doesn't really have exciting, credible challengers. You know, you Jake can only Lee, have... They tried, but it just wasn't working. Right, no and they made... Was injury prone. They made honest attempts to do some stuff. They also probably bungled some people like Ashino um, in a way that they, they, they probably should have handled better. But over the last 18 months, and especially over the last year, I think the, the they really, with with uh, Aoyagi, they really found someone who, even if he's not quite as good as Kento, and Kento is like one of my five favorite wrestlers in the world, so I don't think almost anyone is as good as Kento, but he feels like a true equal to Kento and can be a, a long-term rival for him, and he's only probably going to get better over the next few years. And I think that's Yuma, a huge Yuma and his younger brother yeah. Atsuki. They feel and have felt in the last year to eighteen months like the heart and soul of that company. Mm -hmm. Um there was there was a moment early last year, I think, or maybe the year before, where Yuma basically spoke out and with Japanese wrestling and stuff said in the media sometimes you take it with a grain of salt but he basically kind of spoke out in terms of what he wanted the future of all japan to be and it, it just kind of it came across like someone who was incredibly invested in wanting to lead this company and i it like we are hearing a lot about kind of the all japan backstage dynamics now in terms of the different roles people have and there's official things like kento now being a, the chairman, I guess he is. He's basically the link between the wrestlers and the and the the office. I I really firmly believe that Yuma Aoyagi in the last eighteen months um, has had a significant influence on that promotion in terms of the. It always felt like an old promotion, even with Kento there. There was just a lot of older guys who could still do good things, um, but it just, it had, it didn't feel like a young person's company, both in terms of the wrestlers and in terms of the fans. Um, like, I went to an All Japan show in 2016, and I went to a bunch of shows in Tokyo that week, and it was glaring how the audience, and it was a pretty full cork and hall, but how the audience was pretty much mostly like males in their late thirties into their late fifties. It was like an older crowd. Um, and now you look at an old Japan audience and it's growing all the time and getting more vocal and more into the product all the time. And it's kids, it's women and You've got Yuma and Atsuki and a couple of other guys who are really at the forefront of leading this. And they're putting out all this merch and apparently it flies off the shelves. Like they have all this branding of the Atsuki brothers or the Aoyagi brothers that they put on to everything from stationery to perfumes to and like all the fans are picking it's picking this stuff up and it's they I, I believe they've got a podcast that they do or something like that and it's it really feels like a more forward thinking youthful vibrant company than it and, has and in... that is something that is something the scene i think in general has really struggled with across yep. the board especially over the last 10 years especially outside of new japan in just terms of and we can get into this we're going to talk about noah but all Japan was the same way where it was like it felt really reliant on older wrestlers. And it wasn't like all those wrestlers were Kijimuto in terms of being big stars. It was a lot of guys who never really had that high of a ceiling to begin with that were somehow still getting huge pushes and long title runs um, and kind of stifling a younger generation. And the result was like what you said when you went to the all Japan show in 2016, which is like this atmosphere. It's like, if you go to see like, um, I was thinking about this when I went to go see killers of the flower moon in theaters. And I was like the youngest person in the theater by about 40 years. 
<laughs> and it's like, well, yeah, because I'm going to see a Martin Scorsese, Robert De Niro period piece movie. Like, it's not necessarily going to attract a bunch of people my age. Um, and it's like when you're pushing older wrestlers that, <laughs> I don't know, don't have a youthful connection at all, as opposed to, like you said, pushing the Aoyagi brothers. So, Yuya Oyagi, he's still under 30, right? Yeah, Yuma, is, Yuma started when he, I think he was 18 when he had his debut yeah. match. So he's always been younger than you think. And he kind of has an older look about him, I think, as well. So he's, yeah, I think he's only like 26, I want to yeah, say. that sounds and about Atsuki right. And Atsuki is maybe two or three years younger. And, but you have um, a younger wrestlers to reflect a younger fan base. And yep. I think, and I think part of the anxiety about WWE's involvement in all Japan is because the company over the last year has felt hot, and yeah. vibrant, and exciting. Hey, I understand and... it. Don't get me wrong. I absolutely understand and can totally, um, I could totally see where people are coming from and why people were concerned. I just personally was taking a wait and see approach mm-hmm. to it, and uh, that I was also seeing a lot of. There is a lot of other dynamics at play, uh, other than WWE, that I didn't know how they all relate together, how they all link together. So ultimately, I've kind of taken the stance that I'm just going to keep watching, and as long as it's really good and enjoyable, I'm not going to question it too much. And I mean, they had two really fun Cork and shows to start the year, coming off the amazing New Year's Eve show and main event. And now they've got a big show built up with Ashino versus Nakajima for the end of the month. And it's Jesse, Ashino's time, finally. Did you see the end of the second Korokan show where Ashino had come down to the ring and made his challenge and Nakajima goes to the back? So Ashino's left there and they play Metallica and he's in his All Japan tracksuit and the crowd are all cheering him and he pulls the crest off, uh, up to his and he kisses the crest like it's his Arsenal jersey. He's a big Arsenal fan so you won't like him. Um, yeah. But uh, he kisses the crest and he pounds his chest and he's like uh, oh, uh, yeah, that... this, is actually, this is actually most unwelcome news now. <laughs> so yeah, I was very happy to see it. Uh, yeah, h- h- him in that All Japan track. See, that just yeah. that just really spurred me on. I was like, you know what? I'm I'm just going to keep enjoying this promotion. And a lot of the wrestlers over those two days had kind of rallying cries. Like that was his rising Hayato had one. Um, and he's become a guy, a very, like he, he's another guy who very much has a youthful and. Um, well, when uh, you start and when you start seeing some young guys get elevated up to that picture, it gives you more enthusiasm for even guys below them. Because the idea is that there's a path upward and it's not going to be, you know, Suwama and Ishikawa in the main event forever. Um, yeah. And, and I think... And, and, and Zai is like, it's crazy. This this kid debuted in September 2022 and he was spoken of as this prodigy. Nagata wanted him for New Japan. He ends up going to All Japan. He has the connection of being at the same university as Suwama and Jumbo Saruda. And I think Hiroshi Hase was that university as well. Um, but uh, yeah, he has this big connection and there was big plays from he's tall, he's good looking, he's a great athlete, great amateur wrestler. And um, he just, and, and it's funny because Nagata wants him for New Japan, but then Nagata ends up being in all Japan as like his mentor. They do the real world tag league together and and then he ends up wrestling Nagata for the Triple Crown less than a year into his career. And he showed a lot of, like there, there was a lot of reason to be excited based on his performance in that match. And he's just kicked on ever since. And now he's in this tag team with Ryuki Honda, who like on the surface, they seem like two totally different kind of dudes. And, but they, they have chemistry together and they work as a team. Not a great tag team name. Got to say Japanese wrestling sometimes doesn't come up with the best, uh, the best names for factions or wrestlers. Um, uh, new period, I'm not so sure about for uh, uh, Anzai and Ryuki Honda, but they work as a team, even if the name goes uh, goes against them a little bit. Um, but uh, yeah, Anzai, it's like uh, people were excited about the thought that he might be challenging Nakajima um, after those Korokan shows. I'll take Ashino, um, and but having Anzai wait when they do Anzai Nakajima, it's going to be a hot match. 
Yeah, and I think with Nakajima, like he, it seems. I mean, we'll see what eventually happens. It seems like All Japan is a temporary stay for him after he left Noah. Um, may, maybe not, but that seems to be the impression that I got when he when he first showed up. But he's been such a good signing for them because obviously he's a great wrestler. He has credibility as a main eventer. Um, he's the perfect guy to kind of put it in for like a relatively short term run where he's a heel. He wins the championship. He disrespects the promotion. Uh, and he goes out there and he has really good matches that also work into the style of character that he's portraying, which is this kind of dick superior heel. Um, and it's been a great find. And it also helps kind of break up, um, I don't want to say like the monotony, but like Aoyagi has this long title run. You, and you, you end up kind of taking the title off of him and you you have to go in another direction. And it can't just be he wins the title again. Because I think that was part of the problem with, I think, Kento was that Kento kind of – Kento kind of always had to be the the Triple Crown champion. And if he wasn't, it would be like this is a significantly worse situation than if Kento was just the champion. Yeah, if he wasn't the Triple Crown champion, then he was like winning the champion carnival and challenging for the Triple Crown. Like, yeah, it's it's you... kind of this hole where it's like – there's really only one guy that should be our champion at all times, but he also just can't be champion for five thousand straight days. Yeah. Um, and so this, and, and, this is and not now the... you, you've you've got the you had the opportunity to do it with Yuma, but you Yuma had the title there for seven months, and it's like okay, he's had a good stint. And but this is a don't great really want to go back to Kento and Nakajima, and this whole story has come at the perfect time. Yeah, it's a great follow up chapter to what the story you can tell about. Yuma after he's lost the championship um and you're going to need to be able to do that consistently because presumably he's going to be around for the next 10 years and you don't want him to grow stale on that position uh one other thing I really like is I like that Kento and Yuma have a tag team uh just because I find it's very old school for like the two top baby faces to have a tag team and they've had some really exciting matches including a match inexplicably against the Saito brothers um which is Jesse, one of are the... you come are you coming around yet on the Saitos being uh, actually good? I think the Saitos can, um, can can be good when they're working with two of the best wrestlers in the world. Um, I I think they're uh, I don't know they're they're starting to. I was with you on that, and even before that, I was I was even harsher against them. I was like, no, they're the worst wrestlers in the world. They'll never have a good match. Well, um, but what they... I push back against is in that that match that we're talking about, which I think took place I want to say in October. Um, and it was like this 40 minute tag team match and like, there's this idea. It's like, Oh, the Saito's held up their end of the bargain. And like, it wasn't just Kento and, and Yuya. And I will push back and say, it actually was just, just Kento and Yuya. What was so interesting about that match was it, it's not my match of the year or anything like that, but what it made it one of the most interesting matches of, of 2023 was that you almost never see wrestlers that are that incompetent working like a major main event match for that length of time like the standard for this is something you would see back in like the 80s in like the territories um where like rick flair would have to go in there and have like this four-star match with just this completely uh you know clueless opponent and this was like the closest thing to that, which were these two excellent wrestlers just getting the absolute best out of these two not very good wrestlers. And you don't really see that anymore. Usually there's a baseline level of competency for major main event performers that even people that are considered kind of mediocre are still pretty capable. Uh, and I don't I don't view the Saito brothers as that, but I just think that these two guys, Kento and Yuma, um, Yuma, are... Let me ask you. I am open to the idea that if on that night, if they weren't in there with Kento and Kento and Yuma, it would not have gone as well. I'm, I I can I can totally buy that argument. I I would give them a little more credit than you for that. But um, uh, I will say this: since that match, I don't know if it was a case of that match in their hometown, drawing a big crowd, the crowd being behind them. I don't know if that gave them confidence, but since that match. I have noticed huge improvements in their timing, their um, their uh, how good their stuff looks, like they're just yeah. Timing is the word I'd use, and it's I 
I, I'm slow to compare them to this person yet because I think he's an all-time great, but they're developing a lot of the qualities that made Akira Taue an all-time great in my eyes. That, yes, he didn't look like... He was the most awkward-looking wrestler. His just stuff looked weird, but his sense of knowing what to do when and knowing his style and how it should work with the opponent he was in there with was what made him able to have so many great matches. Um, And I I think that's what I'm starting to see with them. And I, there's been a couple of times since that tag that I've been particularly impressed by them. Um, Two examples I'll give are the match they had with each other on New Year's Eve where they just basically went out and pl- I, I love the build to this match was that they they won uh or they they won or came second for like rookies rookie of the year but it was like the Saito brothers so they they cut a promo saying they they weren't happy with this and they needed to determine who the real rookie of the year was so they'd wrestle each other and they went out and just you know had a damn great hoss fight I thought just knocking seven shades of crap out of each other and I really enjoyed that match. And then I really, really thought they were excellent in... Um, they've had a couple of very good matches with uh, Anzai and Honda, which, again, to a degree, you could credit that to the opponents, um, knowing how to work with them and being really good themselves. But Anzai is such a, a inexperienced guy still that, I don't know, I think you have to give the Saito some credit for that. But the, the match I'd point to is actually from Galate, Um on their Tokyo Dome City Hall show. They've been the, the Galate Tag Team Champions. I forget the name of those titles, but uh, um, G-Infinity, I believe, are the tag titles. But they've had those tag titles for a couple of months now, and they defended them against... Uh, oh, it was a really random team. It was Yuya, Susumu, and... Um, oh, God, I forget the guy's name. Uh, he's been with Galate since the start. Real... Uh, Soma Watanabe. Just these... Two kind of pretty boy, junior, uh, flashy wrestlers who are like the last people who you would expect to have a good match with the Saito brothers. And not exactly a pair of guys who have like a litany of great matches under their belt. And I thought that match ruled. And I thought the Saitos were everything they did in that match was just perfect for who they are. And just everything worked. Um, so yeah, I, I'm starting to see real progress with them and, uh, I hope it continues because they clearly outside of the in ring belt bell stuff, they're clearly big stars within the all Japan environment. They're outside of the ring, getting a lot of publicity. There's an interest in them. Um, they are going to be draws within the context of all Japan for, for the next while. And you can tell they are because so many promotions outside of all Japan are queuing up to use them on their shows. They are unique draws for whatever reason. They've got some gimmick with like axes that I don't understand. That's apparently really over. They showed up to a couple of shows in the real world tag league in a taxi, um, which was delightful. Um, I didn't understand what was going on at all. But apparently that's a thing. Um, so yeah, love the Saito brothers. Hope to see uh, hope to see more good stuff from them next year or this year. Yeah, um, I'm not gonna. I'm not that excited about the Saito brothers. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I didn't sell you. And it, well, you started with a Tawe comparison, which is not uh, how you're gonna oh, run over. Um, I, I was thinking as I was saying that I was thinking, is is, is Jesse a Tawe disrespecter? I feel like he might be. Like obviously, I Tawa is a good wrestler. I'll say that. Um, that you I wouldn't use the words "all time great." Like I wouldn't I did. use the terms. I wouldn't use the term "wrestling observer hall of famer." Um, oh. let's, just, let's just say that. Um, Jesse. Nor nor do I just like Dave changing the rules to get him in, but whatever. The um. <laughs> uh yeah, and, and the last thing I'll say is that Kento, like, I think some people could criticize Kento for being like formulaic. And I guess if you've been working in, main event, in the main events for a number of years and you've kind of always been the same character, that makes sense. But I just get such a kick out of him working an audience and he's got a very kind of like old school connection with being able to just sell and get 
the fans, even fans that have seen him in countless big matches before, invested in whatever he's doing. There were only two wrestlers in the world who I would be interested in seeing wrestle Omos, and Kento is one of them, and Darby Allen is the other, just because they're the only two people I could think of that could make that match kind of interesting because of the way, and for totally different reasons. But I would I would like to see that match just because I think Kento would be able to get every single person in that arena cheering for him by the end of it. Kento is when when I hear people talk about him maybe being formulaic, I I think he is formulaic in the way that Bret Hart was formulaic. Um and that is the best way you're formulaic. It's like that's a compliment of the highest order. It's like someone who figures out a formula that works really well and works every time. Like when Kento when Kento's patterns that he has in his match stop getting organic positive reactions from crowds and not even just crowds, me watching at home, like I see this guy do stuff in the closing sequences of his matches that I've seen him do like 200 times probably before. And sometimes I'll react to them like I'm seeing it for the first time because he's just so good at how he weaves it all together. And it's just, it's magic. And it's like, it's a, he's taken things from kind of, you know, different people. And, and like, I mean, his whole like, uh, shut down German suplex spot with the uh, where he has the struggle for the arms like that totally cribbed from Tozawa. Um, uh, but it it he has made that part of his repertoire, part of his closing stretch, and he's mixed it with other things, and it just the formula works, and it works in tags, it works in singles, and obviously a huge thing that helps him with regard to helping it all come together is his most important attribute. And that is his charisma. Um, his, he is one of the most charismatic wrestlers on earth. Um, I was surprised in the sense that I'd never kind of thought about it before, but when I did hear it and think about it, it made all the sense in the world when they, I believe it was Chris Charlton explained on um, commentary at the uh, all together show last year, that Kento discovered pro wrestling by his dad renting out 80s WWF tapes and he became the biggest Hulk Hogan fan and Hulk Hogan was his professional wrestling idol and the person that wanted him to that made him want to become a pro wrestler and I heard that and I was like what Hulk, Hulk Hogan and I was like you know what yeah I, I see that <laughs> if he, is he's work rate Hulk Hogan yeah he um yeah, like like when we talk about like some one man's formulaic can be another man's consistency, right? His yeah. matches maybe are similar, but they're almost always very good. This is like the Ishii argument, which is like, yes, Ishii matches are very similar, but they're almost always very good. They almost always get organic reactions. And you get that same kick out of like, oh man, Ishii like no sold that that shot and then did a clothesline. Like he's done that like a million times, but you still yeah. pop for it. Yep. Um, when you're good at it, you know how to connect with an audience and you know exactly when to fire up and when to kind of stop selling. Um, that's the kind of magic that you can have in pro wrestling. And it's what, it's what guys strive for. It's yeah. to, to find that and then to find what works and then use it in, in interesting ways and use it and use it in with different people. So like that he can it can be like if Kento was signed for a match tomorrow with, I don't know, Darby Allen, I would, I would be super excited to see how the Kento formula worked with Darby Allen. If he was signed to face, um, 1992 Bam Bam Bigelow, I would be excited to see how it would work with 1992 Bam Bam Bigelow. It's like, you know, just it's, He's great. He's been one of the best in the world for for a long time now. And um, I had him. I strongly will of the FSM fifty coming out in the next couple of days. And uh, I really on my list debated until the until the end whether I would have 
my number one wrestler of 2023 be Kento Miyahara or Brian Danielson? Um, I was super torn on that. Uh, I switched him around a couple of times. Um, so yeah, um, he's awesome, and uh, I I hope he I hope they find interesting things to do with him throughout this year and interesting matches for him to have throughout this year whilst keeping him away from the triple crown um until they need to put him back into that mix yeah i want to pivot to new japan here and obviously we're coming off of wrestle kingdom and kind of the the definitive nature of that and kind of setting up what 2024 is going to look like for that company and to me my interest in new japan over the last year and will continue to be so is I am interested in the high quality of matches that they have, but I'm really, really interested and invested in how they go about getting this next generation of wrestlers over yep. to that next level. I'm right because, there with you. And I, Wrestle Kingdom was a successful show. It was a very good show. I didn't come away from that show thinking that like the next generation of, of new Japan stars are here. I thought it was largely reliant on kind of the older generation and, and things like that. Um, and they, they, they've kind of gone where they've said like, we're going to try to accelerate people faster than well, we the, that came from the office and it right. feels like there was a, um, the so i've had new japan dynamic described to me before as church and state mm -hmm. um and uh ghetto is very um um protective of the church that's his domain and he doesn't like interference from the state at all and yeah and, and ghetto he he felt that there was an element of interference there and then pushing their and for potentially um, their very well-founded intentions, i.e. pushing younger people quicker. Like, I think there's a lot of big argument for that, but he didn't like that argument. He didn't like that argument coming from outside the church. Um, if that's going to happen, it's going to happen because he decides it's going to happen. And now we see like, yeah, I, I think... Uh, I don't know. I, it's going to happen at, at his pace. Um, and now that Tanahashi is in there, I think that only sort of fortifies Ghetto's position and and get and the people around Ghetto, your Dick Togos and people like that. I think their position is well fortified now, and they can do things as they want to do it without interference. And I think with like like looking at wrestling, like last year, you know, they kicked the tires on Sonata. They finally went all the way with Sonata. Um, which I don't think was a bad idea at all. I think it was they had to was try to worth do, a try, yeah, yeah, at worth this a point, try. Now or never. Um, I don't think that he lived up to. Uh, I don't think he hit the he cleared the bar that had been set for him in terms of uh, what like a long title run should be for him, uh, in pretty much any way, shape, or form, whether from a business way or or performance way. Uh, but I do think that was a progressive move and they have moved their guys up to a degree. Um, if you look at that generation, the Uminu and the, um, Yoda Suji kind of class of people. And it's but, two well, steps forward, one step back a lot of time with those just, guys, I find. Yeah, it feels, and it feels, it feels like they've, 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 especially with, I'll, I'll focus on Shota and Yoda Suji because I think they're the two people with the highest potential at this point. Um, some people will throw in you and Mora to that, but I, I want to see more of you and Mora, um, before I, I throw him into the group with, with Suji and, and, and Umino. I'll um, let you finish your talk, but I just want to say the guy for me is Oiwa. Right, but he's so I'm I, yeah I I'm kind of looking at at least with Suji and Umino we've got like at least a year of these guys not being, uh, young lions, and so we've kind of seen what they've done. I'm not I'm not anti these super potent uh, these you know other guys having potential, um at the same level. I'm just kind of thinking about that class and 
they've they put those guys into some prominent matches, but they still seem hesitant to go all the way. I am a really big Suji guy. I just think that he has all of the tools and he has also really delivered when asked. And I'm a little bit frustrated that he hasn't been pushed all the way yet. It feels like he's stuck in like, okay, well, he's going to have to wait three or four years before he gets to the real top. And I think there needs to be more urgency there. Just as a fan, um, I'd like to see more urgency there. Um, like like N- Naito, the whole Naito angle leading up to Wrestle Kingdom, it it seems like it was you know pretty successful from a business perspective, which is the most important thing. Wrestle Kingdom drew pretty well. Um, he's obviously a hugely popular wrestler and remains so. Um, did we have to build the WrestleMania, uh, the Wrestle Kingdom main event around him saying a catchphrase at the end? And I get it was like a cool moment when he did it, but like, did that really need to be the definitive moment of, of New Japan over the last year? Building apparently up it saying, did because so many people were so living and dying with it. I know, I, I know, I know. Like, I don't want to. I'm gonna. I don't want to. You know, make the people mad. They're gonna tell me that the um. You know, it was obviously hugely successful. So I try to preface it by saying it was obviously business success for that moment. But like as a as a fan, it's like I don't really care that Naito is going to say his catchphrase. Like uh, what I wanted to see was was progression for the new generation. And Yoda Suji and Yuya Uemura wrestling like third from the top in the singles match that no one's going to remember. Um, not to say that it was bad, but like that wasn't what I wanted from Suji. Um, and Umino wrestling evil in a forgettable tag team match. That's not what I wanted from to see from Umino on, at the biggest stage. Hopefully this year is a, is a much brighter focus on pushing them further to the top. But I feel like that they have not gone all the way with them in a really aggressive way that I think might be needed um, for this company to move forward as that generation, the, 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 you know, the older generation begins to really slow down. So a couple of things. Um... The I suppose taking the uh, the two step forward, one step back, or one step forward, two steps back, whatever way you want to term it. Um, uh, basically, what I'm getting at is kind of an inconsistent push forward for these guys. And with Suji, I suppose the high point was how they brought him back, shot him out of the cannon, right into the main main event scene, and having a IWGP heavyweight title match on one of the biggest shows of the year, Dominion, and kicking ass in that match. Um, To the point that watching that match, I think a lot of people thought he might win the title that night. Uh, He was that good, and they made him, they allowed him to look so good. Um, But since then, he's been kind of held back a little bit with occasional glimpses of oh there he is like the uh the osprey match at uh i think that was destruction i want to say um because yeah it was osprey tsuji at destruction and osprey umino at power struggle um but he's lost a lot he's lost a lot a lot he didn't qualify out of the block in the g1 i think that i think that was a real momentum killer for Mm -hmm for the young guys um, and he was... people's perception of the young guys that they had none of them get out of their block and in in favor of Hikuleo was the guy that got out of the quote young guys block um, he was just it, booked like a guy like a just a guy yeah and... it was disheartening like they, they, they did tell some good stories with those guys interacting with each other um, Narita, Umino, Tsuji uh Gabe Kidd, uh Kaito Kiyomiya, they those guys in their matches with each other, I thought they did a very good job in terms of developing sort of rivalries and stories and, and stuff you can draw back to uh your years down the line. But ultimately all those guys kind of failed in the G1 and from a KFA point of view didn't look very strong. And then from a just a fan enjoyment point of view, 
if these are the guys you're excited by, like me, I really lost a lot of interest in the G1 when it got to that knockout stage and none of those guys were there. Like when when we got the G1 blocks and we saw there was going to be like quarterfinals and semifinals and final, I was sort of in my head fantasy booking or mapping things out and I was like coming up with some really exciting quarterfinals that I would have a real investment in and basically got none of, of, of that. Um, so that was really disappointing. Um, they did bits with those guys throughout the rest of the year to I think if you were a World Tag League sicko um, and you watched the the World Tag League I cherry picked it a little bit um, but I think there was a lot of interesting good things they did with those guys in the World Tag League but it's a very if a tree falls in the woods type situation like not a lot of people are paying attention to the World Tag League so does it really matter if you're if you're doing stuff in that but those guys did show some promise and the company did show some comfort in putting some of them in main events during that tournament. Um, but then well, you it mentioned came to like, well, you mentioned like he, his debut is kind of his re debut coming back from his um, excursion in Mexico. His debut is like insane. Like he comes yeah. back and he immediately challenges for the world title. And this is kind of coming on the heels of the reports that they want to get younger, they want to get, they want to be, you know, elevate people at a faster rate. And they have this guy come out and it's like, oh, they're really serious about this because he's coming right out of the gate and he's getting a title shot. And to me, he checks the boxes and like as his performance has been excellent. He looks the part, he's got size, he's does cool moves. He knows how to sell. He's got great facial um, ability. He gets people invested in his he's matches. He's got so much confidence, Jesse. He's such he's such an obvious star to me. And I was like, okay, they're they're, they're they 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 have they have they are putting the rocket on this guy, and he deserves it, uh, which is a very very difficult thing to find. And then, like you said, the G one booking, the young the young guys block. Like he doesn't come out. You can put Hikaleo ahead of him. And it's just like this kind of step back where it's like, okay, so now instead of this guy getting the rocket pack, it seems like he's for, he's now he's on like the three or four year track of getting over. And I just don't, I don't want to say New Japan doesn't have that kind of time because they really do. But as a fan, it's like, we need this next generation of cool wrestlers to step up and you have someone who seems to be totally capable of doing that and it seems unnecessary to kind of hold them back it's very similar you can hold back a couple of them but as long as you're yeah. get one of them at least it, you, know? you know what it really is it feels very similar to uh the way tony khan books people in AEW, where you have some really promising people that don't always have consistent creative direction and it feels like it takes years for them to kind of break through into a higher level um and I would say that there's even a greater urgency in a in New Japan than there is in AEW in terms of getting some new faces into the picture because we've been having the same people on top for a decade. Um, like it 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 didn't really work in the example I'm going to give, but I think there's a lot of extenuating circumstances with that environment at the time which caused it to not work. But um, what they could be doing with these young guys is kind of how they handled Nakamura, Tanahashi, Goto, Shibata, that kind of crop of guys where they held um, like Tanahashi especially was a slow rising guy through the ranks. You know, he was in this tag team with uh, what's his face, Kenzo Suzuki and Kenzo Suzuki was kind of the star of the team and Tanahashi, they, it was slow pace, even though he was someone that had a lot of promise. It was slow. Um, but Shinsuke Nakamura comes out and they, they christen him the supernova. They have him win the IWGP heavyweight title. They have him doing K1 fights, which is where everything kind of fell apart. But uh, um, if they kind of took that model where they just had one of these guys and rocket pack them, I think and Suji would probably be that guy. Like if they had him, I'd know beat Sonata that night. Or if not beat Sonata, at least 
make more of an impact in the G1 following it and then get a really big Tokyo Dome match, I think that guy's ready for it. Um, I, I, I think he's ready for it. I don't think he'd let them down if they went that route. And I also am concerned about the fact that while you're taking your time with him, he's, he's look, he's not, he's not uh, going around on a Zimmer frame, but he's not in his early 20s. He's a bit older. And why have him in a inconsequential position putting miles on his tires when he's a big enough star, right? Uh, uh, potentially a big enough star right now to make him a star get that juice out of him right now because it's there for the taking i could see the argument that it's not there with an umino at times i feel umino still finding himself we see him sometimes like he's going from being cosplay moxley to cosplay tanahashi to cosplay osprey to cosplay naito i just used the word cosplay way more times than i'm comfortable with in in uh, a sentence but he uh he's still finding himself narita is definitely still fine there's there's i wouldn't be i wouldn't be doing anything right now with narita in a big rush because there's i would still have huge question marks about what that guy is going to be i agree um so like there's reasons with some of these other guys to not fire them up into the main slot I, I, there's no reason not to with suji there's no reason not to um I do I I do have to say I liked what they did with him at the Tokyo Dome. Um I understand what you're saying about it, but I I like how they've harkened back to him and Yue Mura and their breaking in together and their their story as contemporaries and I liked how they positioned them in the dome as being clearly this is the future of the company um and giving them this match which i probably enjoyed the match more than you by the sounds of it i thought they really stepped up and delivered in the slot they were in oh it was a good match i'm not i don't think the match was bad i just i I would think like when i look back on what yoda suji did at the tokyo dome this year after kind of how hot he entered the company in back in june it's, uh, it seems like a, uh, and I will say that maybe part of my happiness with what he did is because I had concerns a month out from the Dome that he wasn't even going to be on the card because I didn't see them putting that singles match on there until they did. Um, so there was some relief there and, and I'll take what I can get at that point when I thought he wasn't going to even be on the card. Um, but I think that match will be a huge historical moment for those guys that you can go back to and they'll show they i guarantee you they will be showing highlights of that match in b-roll of video packages building up huge matches with those guys for titles or domain events down the road um the only issue is how long are they going to wait to get there um, history would show that they're probably going to wait longer than they need to. Um, I I just think, yeah, Suji, and it probably sounds like I'm going back and forth in terms of, of this analysis, but it's like, I like what they're doing with him, but I think they could do a lot more. I think there's, like I said, it's it's there for the taking with him right now, so why not do it? But what they are doing is enjoyable and i think it will it will serve a purpose um and i think it probably helps ua mura because i think ua mura is is maybe i think he probably needs suji at this point more than suji needs him i think suji could be in the mix with the okadas and stuff like that i don't think ua mura could um so i think this is a a great and getting the win over Suji, I think, was really big for Uemura to the point that I thought Uemura was going to be the guy to challenge Naito for the title at New Beginning. Instead, they've gone back to Sonata for reasons I can't explain. But um, I thought they were going to do Naito and Uemura. I thought uh, it would be like a 
an easy first defense to do for Naito, a guy, a young guy who can kind of carry the load in that match in terms of the because uh, like you know Naito is he's he's on the on the sl- downslide things of things in terms of his athletic ability and it just ability to move around the ring so Yui Mura could have done a lot of the donkey work in that with Naito kind of guiding things with his, his wrestling brain and I thought that would have been would have been good um but yeah they they haven't gone that route um Does... I think they're programming Suji against Yui Mura again maybe a new beginning um so yeah if uh Ghetto calls you up and says Alan you're allowed you're you're allowed to book next year's Wrestle Kingdom main event yeah. What would you pick for that? With we have a full year to get there, so you can kind of build stuff up. But like, who would you pick to be in that Wrestle Kingdom main event? All things considered, um, I think what I would personally want and think would be the best would be Okada versus Suji. Um, if but giving the respect to Naito and his fans, the I, I'm just totally disinterested in in Naito at this point. And I'm I just wrote a huge big career piece about Naito at the Torch over the last couple of months. It was a two parter. I did the first part after the G1 and the second part, about a week or so before the Dome. So I've been a huge Naito fan. He was the he was the first rookie I saw when I became a Japanese wrestling fan, and I followed his journey from literally the beginning um, through to now. And But I'm just kind of over it with him. He's not really showing me anything new. Um, but he's I can't deny he's still wildly popular. Like that reaction. I was, even knowing how popular he is, I was caught off guard by how how big of a reaction he got on January 4th. It was shocking to me. Um, And if he's able to stay healthy for this next year and those fans stick with his title reign, then I could maybe see the smart move being to get that next Dome main event out of him and have him put over Suji, but either way I'm going Suji against a one of the two big guys in the company being Okada or Naito. My that's personal exactly preference. the that's exactly the match that I think of. I think Suji yeah. has to I want Suji going over for the title and I want him going over somebody who is recognized as a hugely established champion. You see, which... I could I could have him if it's Naito, I think he has to win. If it's Okada, mm-hmm. I could have I would be. I think a Suji loss could work against Okada, and that and that is how Ghetto would normally book it, right? Yeah, Ghetto uh, would have. He would have yeah. Suji lose, especially to Okada. Okada um, lost his first dome main event to Tanahashi, right? Because he he well, won it wasn't it really the U- main event. Oh no, no, sorry, that was the Naito man. Never mind. He Apologies. won it. Um, he won it in February. Lost it in June, and then he lost to Ok. He lost to Tana on January fourth, and he beat him at Invasion Attack in April twenty thirteen. So yeah, he lost his first Tokyo Dome main event against Tanahashi. He won his second one, but that was against Naito, and then he lost to Tanahashi. Again, the next time they main event at the dome. Um, so yeah, he he had multiple losses to Tanahashi in dome main events before he beat him. Um, and I could see them doing something similar. And like Okada is the guy they have successfully rocket packed and elevated more than any like that's like the best case scenario is Okada, right? And during For any time, of these guys, and he was ele- Okada was elevated during a time where they really needed somebody like him. Yeah, too. he's like he's the best possible result of that of that approach to a new star, and even him, 
had to lose a couple of, of domain events to a, a veteran like Tanahashi before he was able to beat him. So okay. even I mean, if, if Suji were... wins the if Suji wins the title this year and then loses a domain event, I think that's I think that's fine. Like that's obviously hugely productive. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm, Suji, I'm I'm under the you assumption could have Suji that's... beat Naito and lose to Okada. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm under the assumption when I was thinking about the Russell kind of main event, I was saying Suji hasn't won the world title yet. So like he wins the G1 and that's like the, okay, Suji is here and he's coming for the title. But it is possible for Suji to win the title, you know, in April or something like that. I think... Um, but I don't think Suji's going to be in the Wrestle Kingdom main event. No. I don't know. I think the main event is more likely to be like, <laughs> what I think is true that much, I think it's more likely to be Naito Okada than than uh, most other possibilities. Yeah. It, um, you know, you know, evil could get the title back. Um, nah. nah I, I, Dick Togo's I, got I, more I th- power. You, you said it earlier. <laughs> I think, I think evil is, I think they very much see him slotted in a role. That's not a, um, and not well, a Tokyo kinda, main eventer well, level role. Speaking of evil in that sense, it does feel like New Japan has this kind of vacancy where they really didn't have what I would call a super productive uh like era of young generation of young lions. Um, where that that group that should be like in their early thirties or mid thirties right now that should really be carrying, you know, the main event scene hasn't really come to fruition for a number of different reasons and the ones that you do have are kind of slotted and firmly entrenched well beneath uh the main event picture really and i don't know if that's poor booking or talent evaluation guys not getting over enough guys having uh you know career issues um well, if, if feels... you look at so if if you're thinking about that, you're thinking about who came through the dojo during the golden period, right? So at the start, you have Sho, Yo, um, mm-hmm. and Evil, uh, Watanabe. Okay, so those three guys, it's like two of them are basically non entities in, in Sho and Yo. Um, not even they never even reached the top of the junior division. Yep. Um, Evil has been evil. Uh, he is just what he is now. I don't think that's going to change. Um, I think he'll just be like an Azuka character on the on the roster for until the end of his career, um, where he's like he is an act that's on the he is a part of the show is an act that is a part of the show. That go to a New Japan show, you know you'll experience the evil act, but it's he just is what he is, and he's not going to be playing into things in any meaningful way um it's going to be about who interacts with evil at any period of time rather than what evil is doing um evil will be a part of other people's journeys more than evil is having a journey himself for the rest of his career um show and yo as i said non entity so then who came after them um who was the next i can tell you couple? who came after them it was it was uh Jay White Finley. Well, that's true. Well, wasn't it Kitamiya? Yes, it was. I and think was, no. They were. They were. So before them was Finley, Jay White, Watto, and there was another dude who was like Tenzan's protege, and he ended up retiring. I forget his name. Um, oh, yeah, I forgot about Watto. Um, yeah, Hiraiko yeah, Watto. Jay White and Finley. Like, I don't really consider them because they they came in with a level of polish. Like, he did. Yep. was Juice Robinson was also technically a young boy, wasn't he? Um, I don't think so. I don't think so. Juice never had to do like the black tights, black uh, trunks, and White and Finley. I feel like I rem- I could distinctly remember Juice wearing the black trunks, but maybe I'm no, wrong. No, no, he they. They brought him in. He was he was teaming with Naito when Naito was kind of doing the solo, uh, um, Los Ingobernables stuff before uh, Evil joined him. Um, uh, so, yeah, I so then you have the next crop is is Okan, um, Kitamiya, and Umino and Narita, right? And so 
So like people forget Umino's been there. Umino and Narita have been there like six years now. Um so it like it's a long time. Um so yeah, well, Yoda, but, yeah, yeah, Suji debuted in 2018. Yeah. Suji Suji and Uemura debuted before the pandemic, like a year before the pandemic. Um, yeah, well, like Suji and Uemura kind of like I don't know if they'd be considered the same young lion class as Uminu, but they were both young lions at the same time, just kind of at different yeah. phases. Yeah, exactly. Um, and there was, I think there was another guy who, um, I forget his name. There was another guy who was not going to bet around then who ended up retiring. Um, but if, if you, if you look at, um, Okan, so Okan is someone who you would want to see, um, seven years in having, being at maybe a higher level and, and they, they had big hopes for him in terms of Kidani was a big backer of him because of his um, just the amateur wrestling side of things and also just some I know uh, there were there were things I can't remember specifically but there were things about Okan that they thought like outside the ring that kind of made him a bit of a star um, and they had really high hopes for him. I think the gimmick was. I think the gimmick has. It gives him an identity, but I think at times it holds him back. The most I have been impressed with Okan has been the last two to three months. That Moxley match, which I don't think I even loved it as much as most people. People seem to really rave about that match. I think Tanahashi called it his match of the year. Um, but... Uh, um, I call it the carpet uh, match. Was that? I call it the carpet match. That's all I can think <laughs> about when I think of <laughs> it. Was like something changed within Okan, not just his hair getting cut coming out of that match. Because I talked about the World Tag League earlier, and him and Hanare as a team were absolutely incredible in that tournament. Those guys shocked the life out of me with how good they were and okan was he was just he was just wrestling more jesse just in the sense of just wrestling like a normal japanese wrestler but with the intensity and the aggressiveness um he was wrestling like mid-80s killer khan teaming with choshu and uh, people like that where yes there's the gimmick there but it's like previously he's been wrestling like WWF Killer Khan. And now he's starting to wrestle like mid-80s All Japan Killer Khan. And he's just moving faster, hitting harder, just that bit more aggressive, less showy. Like I I didn't feel like he was doing like he's got some of these showy spots he does, like where he sits on the guy in the corner and so he might have still done that a bit, but I didn't notice him doing as much of that kind of stuff. Um less of the kind of just, you know, choking a guy and stuff like that for a prolonged period, which I find things like that to be like a momentum killer. Um it's just being a badass wrestler. And there was one match where him and um it's a super unique match. It's it's him and Hinare against Kiyomiya and Oiwa. Um, I do want to speak about those guys and how they play into things um, soon here. But uh, they they had this match where um, earlier in the match you see a couple of exchanges between Okan and Oiwa and so amateur wrestling style exchanges and. And the commentary is putting them over as as both having really high level amateur backgrounds, and then like that's typically something you'd see often in like the early stages of a match with guys with that kind of ground game uh, that they will feel each other out and, and do that kind of thing. This match breaks down, and I'm not sure if Hinari suffers like a legit injury and he and they have to kind of change stuff on the fly or if this was part of like their idea for the match but Hinari's kind of taken out for a bit and like in the last like couple of minutes of a 20 or so minute match Oiwa and Okan just kind of end up in this standoff and then they just do like two or three minutes of 
the most intense, badass, amateur wrestling style, scrapping it out. And like at this stage in the match, they're tired, they're worn down, but they're like dumping each other on their heads. They're like scratching and clawing for positions. It was so awesome. And it's just, it was such a different type of thing that you'd see towards the end of a New Japan match. Um, and it, it, honestly, it was the, it was the time in Okan's career that I've most been like, whoa, there's, there's something here, but they could have been getting this side, this type of thing out of him for any amount of the last seven years. And it's, I don't know, I feel like they've wasted a lot of time with the guy. I worry he might've got a bit too pigeonholed. I worry there might be too much of a stink on him. Um, but if they if they let him do more to get his credibility back throughout 2024, then this could be a rebuild year for him. And in 2025, you could have the makings of a guy who you could start to get contributing more in a meaningful way. But he needs a year of rebuild first. And um, I think, yeah, I think there's a, there, there's a couple of guys you, you could say that about that they're they're not totally dead in the water yet but they need some rebuild yeah i've always um with okan like it's just his his career trajectory to me in my opinion of him has kind of always gone up and down like when he first debuted as a young lion it was coming off the edge where it felt like that a lot of the more promising young lions that new japan had had were junior heavyweights and you see um tomiaka oka come in and he's just this big hawk you know, a big Haas amateur wrestler background. He He's there with Kitamura, who's kind of taking, I think, like a lot of the spotlight from him just because of Kitamura's look was so outrageous. Um, But him and Oka were like, okay, this is the next generation of like the real big New Japan stars, not like junior heavyweights, but like real top guys. And I really liked him as a jun- as a as a young lion. I did not like him when he went on excursion to the UK because I, I didn't like the gimmick. And then he came back and he was like, I personally think the gimmick totally holds him back. I want him to just be amateur wrestling big hoss like he was when he was a young lion, just as a as a as a full-fledged wrestler. Um and he's always at his best when he doesn't have that gimmick. And he's kind of like you said when you said he's just kind of wrestling. And do you think always... do you think they could they could just have him still have that presentation? But be more straightforward like yeah, so because it comes well, I, on I think and off of, when, like when, it's when not like jay white when jay white came back from his excursion it was oh he's switchblade it was all about switchblade and he's this fucking knife wielding pervert or whatever the, the gimmick was but very quickly very very quickly he was just jay white um and like he had the aesthetic of the switchblade character but and then the na- the move names were a, a nod to that, but but he was just himself with a like could Okan keep the great Okan look essentially and but wrestle and present himself in a more simple way? Would that work for you? Yeah, I just I don't in you like he's kind of fluctuated back and forth between leaning heavily into the gimmick and then the gimmick kind of receding a little bit. And I, I I think at this point, I'm kind of out on him as a potential top guy. Um, especially, he obviously wasn't booked to do much at Wrestle Kingdom. Um, I just, I and I, I think of when you look at, like, the elevations of guys like Suji, you know, Uminu, and these other guys like Oiwa. Um, oh, yeah, it feels like he's been passed out. It I feels guess. like he's he was in I, – I noticed this during the G1, and I thought, like, Okan's really got to have a big G1 because I feel like he's losing ground as a potential top guy because he hasn't gotten there yet, and he's got now younger people that are coming up, up at his heels, and I feel like those guys have even passed him at this point, or at least some of them have. And I just – I don't I don't see – I don't know how much of it is booking and I don't know much how much of it is him, you know, wanting to be at that top level or if he's comfortable being in like this more evil like role where he can work a gimmick and he'll like he'll like he's how you describe evil evil. He'll be an act on the show, but he's not going to be a top guy. 
Um, and I think he at one point had that ceiling and occasionally it flashes, but part of being a top guy is consistency. And I don't know if he yeah. has that. And I don't know if he wants to have that. Well, I saw some encouraging signs more than I have in the past with him. And uh, yeah, I'm he's someone I'm keeping my eye on, but I don't, I'm not a, I'm not laying down money on uh, on his future. Like it's it's far from a sure thing. Now, um, what what do you think about the current young lions? Okay, so I have I have quite a few thoughts on on, on these guys. I'll try to to get through them quick quick enough. So, Oiwa is a guy. So, Oiwa and Kosei Fujita both debuted at a time where I was really not watching a lot of New Japan. Um, it was post pandemic kind of where things are still kind of the tail end of the pandemic where the a lot of my um excitement for japanese wrestling and new japan in particular had been kind of drained away and um they were i, I was aware of their existence as there's these new young lions but i hadn't been really watching you know so um but then like i would say last year i pretty much all year was consistently watching stuff and I saw um, Kosei Fujita uh, join up with TMDK and followed his journey thought that was interesting Um, watching Oiwa and uh, um, uh, oh god I'm forgetting a dude's name Um, the the Oscars partner in um, in uh, Bolton Oleg no, 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 Japanese guy. He is. I always think of him as as Makabe Junior. Um, he's the guy that's gone on an excursion with uh, with um, with Oscar. Uh, oh, I know who you're talking about. Yeah, good. The, 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 everyone's screaming at at their at their computer right now. But anyway, um, so th- this crop of guys, like their initial their initial days, I wasn't really focused and honed in on them. but last year i got more of a feel for them all and what i have found really interesting with this group of guys is the different approaches they're taking to their excursions or lack thereof um and i think that's badly needed i think new japan has been so stuck in its ways in terms of how it's programmed that you go through as a young lion. I think there's huge value in excursions, but I think they can also be just a disaster and overly long and they fall into traps with them that they don't need to. But they have taken a varied approach to this crop and it's it's been really interesting to see, and it's going to be really interesting to see how they all kick on and how how different they all are as a result of the different approaches that are being taken. To them. So Kosei Fujita, a guy who, instead of going on an excursion, they just slapped a TMDK t-shirt on him, and Zack Sabre Jr. is like, no, nah, he's he's my guy. And I believe, like behind the scenes, like some he was someone that Zach very much took under his wing from a, a, a very early stage, and that's reality playing out kind of on screen. And he just fit with those guys, the TMDK guys, perfectly all year long. And they joked about how he, when he went to Australia for a couple of weeks, he was only there for like two weeks and he came back as the most australian japanese man ever in uh that he just like yeah he he's it, like that guy feels so far removed from being a young line now he was getting in the face of okada on new year's dash and uh um on the christmas shows he had some great interactions with okada uh, he to me i think he is the future of the junior heavyweight division I'm so excited about him. I think he's got so much to offer and he's still sickeningly young. That's the other thing about him. Um, But but in terms of technical ability, in terms of charisma, he's he's got it. The only thing he doesn't have is size. So you make him a junior. Um, 
that'll be it'll be fine um they need they need a great junior to be honest um so hey might as well be him um then oiwa what they've done with this guy is sending him to pro wrestling noah as kia mia's tag team partner which is the it, they've never done anything like that before to my knowledge and it's been working really well he's come back to new japan and done the tag league with kiyomiya and they were one of the best performing teams in that tournament every time i see oiwa first of all every time i see him he seems to have gotten bigger the guy's an absolute unit um but he is more impressive every time i see him his execution on his moves is fantastic stuff he does looks brutal there's no hesitancy he looks like a guy who's fully formed and polished and he probably just needs maybe just kind of to start getting more sort of big match experience and, and then he will be he's going to be off to the races and i think they know it i think they know what a star they have in him and i think kiyomiya has been great for him I think they've been great for each other. I, uh, I've i been meaning to say this somewhere. I keep forgetting to like communicate it to anyone. But I think it's been so funny watching Oiwa and Kitamiya play off each other. And, um, sorry, Kiyomiya. Between Kitamura, Kiyomiya, and Kitamiya, it's very I get confusing. it wrong so much. <laughs> it's just like a shell game where I can never get the first names and the last names connected. I'm sorry. But, okay. but I, already, Kaito... I already butchered it. I think I called um, Katsuya um, Kitamura um, something else. So. They'll, they'll they'll forget, yes. Jesse. But Kaito Kiyomiya, the no- pro wrestling Noah star who's been... Um, there since 2017 or so who they had the ghc title on in 2019 i think it was um and this guy who had so much of his career and oxygen taken from him by keiji muto this legend of japanese wrestling attaching himself to this young star kaito kiyomiya in three months, four months, whatever it's been, has gotten more from being attached to this New Japan young lion, Ryoya Oiwa, than he did in all those years having Keiji Muto attached to him. Oiwa, I, I, it was when they came out at the Tokyo Dome, and Oiwa was standing beside Kiyomiya, and he was just clapping for him and looking up to him like he was his... like. It just made Kiyomiya look like a star in ways that he never did with Muto. Um, their dynamic is fantastic. I love it. Who, whoever had the idea of putting Oiwa, it, oh, sending him to Noah, a, attached to Kiyomiya, it was genius. And it's working so well. And I think they should keep those two together in both companies for a long time going forward there is a bond there that comes across as real and it works for both guys oiwa is getting better all the time by wrestling with a guy who as much as his star has been hurt kaito kiyomi has been a great wrestler for a long time and he is a polished great wrestler and for oiwa a guy who's still young in his career being alongside him is just it's bringing him up to that level and for kiyomiya it having him be like the senior figure in this pairing makes him look good compared to what he has been looking like for the last couple of years as like mudo's jobber so i think that really works and i think there's a lot of interesting things they can do with that and with oiwa going back and forth between the promotions so that's been cool with yeah. uh, Oscar and with um, dude whose name we cannot remember. I still haven't gotten it. You're thinking um, of um, Nakashima, right? Nakashima. There you go. Y- with Utah Oscar and... Nakashima, that's his name, right? Yeah. Utah. Yeah. With with those two who have the tag team name New Blood, which I love, and they just seem to have a real connection, and they're both big bruiser heavyweights. Um, they've taken a more 
traditional approach with them. And now they're going to go over to Europe, it looks like. Um, they're both going to be knocking around WXW for a while. Um, Which is kind of where um, Lube is from. He originally kind of did some work with yeah, so WXW before Oscar, he moved to Japan. He is German and he went to train at the um, New Zealand uh, dojo, the okay. New Japan New Fale's. Zealand dojo. Yeah, so he did his training there. And then the pandemic came about and he went back to Germany and he worked for WXW all during kind of the pandemic period, the no crowd period. And he trained at the WXW Academy. And then when things opened up again, he went over to the New Japan uh, Tokyo Dojo and um, and he became very close with Nakashima. And they have this great dynamic as a team. I think it started start to really catch on with fans and they're going to have the more traditional spend a year or two as black tights young line wrestlers then go on excursion then come back so they're taking the more traditional route with them and then you have the x factor big bolton big oleg here's a guy who has first of all he looks like young brock lesnar Second of all, he's got this ridiculous, on paper, legitimate credential that you just can't really ignore. But at the same time, you have to try to tell this story on a tightrope of how, okay, he's this legitimately credentialed guy, but he's here losing all these matches. And it's like, okay, well, he's still figuring out how to be a pro wrestler or whatnot, but he's got all the tools, but he just... He's not quite he's not quite got the experience and like a guy like Zack Sabre Jr., great match by the way, has just got the, the in ring smarts to be able to uh to defeat him. Whereas in in a shoot, you obviously know that oh oh like would just devour Zack Sabre Jr. But you have to kind of put that aside as you're watching it in suspension of disbelief. But yeah, this guy has got all this potential, but being from Kazakhstan, I don't know how much of a uh, pro wrestling, um, uh, how much he knew about pro wrestling before getting into it. Um, uh, so they're really, they've really got a raw piece of clay here with this guy. And my great idea for him is, I just think this would be so perfect, is that you keep you you need to keep a close eye on him what you don't do with him is what you did with chota umino and send him off and forget about him and he's barely working living in a with in a college dorm essentially in portsmouth in the uk getting out of shape and just a total disaster of an excursion hiromu takahashi uh he had obviously a very successful excursion in Mexico, but people don't aren't aware that Hiromu also had a part of his excursion in the UK where he got hurt and and he was um basically like Fergal Devitt was taking care of him while he was hurt because like the office didn't give a shit and, and he was um yeah, he had to get like surgery and stuff while he was in the UK. And um yeah, really like he was basically just sent away and forgotten about and it was really a real bad deal um but you can't do that without like because the guy might just be like fuck this i he doesn't if he doesn't have this love for professional wrestling he might love it i don't know he might have really embraced it but with a guy that's not getting into it by choice as a, i've always wanted to be a pro wrestler there's got to be that possibility of them just saying fuck this i'm going to do something else and so if you send him away and then and for and and forget about him he might he might rightly be slighted by that um but also when you have someone who has such potential and is so raw you probably want to keep close tabs on him for your own interests so it's both good for him and them that they keep him at a close distance so I don't send him to the wild west of Mexico and Lucha Libre. Obviously, just styles clash there. I don't think that would work out. 
I don't send him to Europe where it's hit and miss in terms of like it could work out really well depending on what promotions or how promotions are doing over there at the time, what schedules people are running, like what's what state the camps are in post Brian Dixon, like that was always a reliable place for guys to work. But if that's not really um, a, an outlet that can be used anymore. So uh, Europe is kind of dicey. The US very much also dicey, like send a guy for AEW to look after them, like AEW can barely make time for all their own guys. Um, then it's the indie scene and it's like, again, kind of wild, wild west. So I I think the best bet for them is to do something similar to what they're doing with Oiwa. Keep him in Japan, but have him get different experiences. And what I think they should do is, and I don't know what the dynamics of the New Japan Galate relationship is like right now. There's a lot of um, figures involved in Galate who have complex relationships throughout the industry in Japan. Cough, Sima, cough. Um, and, uh, but the one thing about Galate is that they have some of the most talented wrestlers of different styles of Japanese wrestling of all time on their books. Shima Kazayashi from a, a Lucha, Lucha Resu side of things, Minoru Tanaka from like the shoot style side of things, and also kind of just general great wrestler. And then you've got like kind of older shoot style guys like Kiyoshi Tamura knocking about and kind of available and connected to the promotion. Um, I would think that having Oleg base himself out of Galate for a year with New Japan, keeping a very close eye on what Galate are doing with him, maybe agreements being formed in advance of, of what will, how he will be used. And I think they could have him work their UWFI style side of things where he can he can because there's a skill to deploying those legit crit those legit abilities in a pro wrestling sense um kyoshi tomorrow might be like the best ever at it and if he could learn from guys like kyoshi tomorrow and minoru tanaka and people like that how to do that and how to make that look really good. That's like making the best use of the skills he currently has. And then you could also have him while well, he's like competing in that on that side of the roster. And maybe I just put their UFI title on him, quite frankly, um, and just build him up like a monster. Um, at the same time, every day he could be in their dojo training with Shima and Kaz Hayashi and the younger guys, learning the fast-paced stuff, the technical stuff the, that you would have, like um, the, the more flashy side of things that he'll need in New Japan. He'll need to be able to work with a, a flashier guy from time to time and have an exciting main event match. He's not going to be able to just be five minute shoot style guy, you know, in, in New Japan. That's not what the promotion is. So he needs to develop those other skills, the the footwork that you would need in a, a fast paced contest, all that kind of stuff. I think the best possible trainers for him for that are in Glate. Um I think Glate gets something from it in terms of having a really interesting guy that they could build around um for a year or however long it might be. Oleg gains from it and New Japan gains from it. So that's what I do with him. Um, how big of a star he ends up being, it's impossible to predict. Don't know what the guy's interest level is. It's obviously enough that he's stuck with it this far. Um, but it's certainly he's certainly an exciting prospect. So there's no doubt about that. And I would be if I was them, I'd be very invested in trying to get as much as I can out of him um, in the future. Yeah, I definitely think you're on the right track in terms of 
these excursions being a risky proposition for someone. And it kind of seems unpredictable in a lot of ways. I think the Aminu one is the one that stands out to me as just like a complete and utter disaster, which is impacted by the pandemic. It's impacted by the UK wrestling scene just completely collapsing while he they was there. They just brought him home. What did they do leaving him he, out there? So what happened with this, like, Aminu gets... He gets stuck there, obviously. And he's even after kind of post pandemic, he's still there. And he has like he does this, he does the the AEW match where he does like the whole thing with Jericho and they do the, the six man tag at the first forbidden door. And I, he looks so good like that. And it seemed like they had some creative direction they could have gone into in AEW. And I was like, he should just stay in AEW and 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 you know, this is when they still had AEW dark and stuff. And I was like he should just stay there because he's – but they sent him back to the UK where he wasn't working regularly, and I feel like it was just such an unnecessary move for him. Um, and I just – I think the wrestling landscape internationally in so many different places um, makes the excursion process so much more difficult because it does seem almost random in what kind of experiences guys can have. And it's not always up to um, – those individual talents and, and how well they achieve. I do like you, Amora. I thought it was interesting. They sent him to impact and he wrestled quite frequently for impact, but, and he also made some, you know, the rounds on the U S Indies. Like... I actually think, um, and Rocky Romero made a comment on commentary, which I found very interesting during the dome show. Um, he, it feels like he was sent to new Japan strong, but, did that a little bit and didn't want to do that anymore and went out and actively and there is stuff we heard at the time which which validates this he kind of cut the apron strings from new japan um and made his own way and mm-hmm. got his own bookings and got his he got himself the impact gig um and he kind of basically formed his own excursion based doesn't on that tell you something he was making. doesn't that tell you something though yeah it, it tells me both something about him and about um uh in terms of him in terms of being proactive and about his career and in terms of knowing what he wants and it tells me about them and the um maybe that their structured plans aren't always the the best or most well thought out yeah, it's it's one of those. And yeah, you're right about. And you you you're pointing out, you know, especially with Oiwa, like the more like internal excursion, which is they're going to rest. They can rest. They can, guys can learn different styles in Japan. You can learn different styles in Tokyo, if you go to the right place. Yeah. Um. It's not like oh, yeah, the crowds obviously, the crowds are different. And I I think everyone should work in Mexico personally because I think there's just so much to be gained by. The crowd connection and kind of the old fashioned um, interactions that I think the the baby faces yeah, even, and the heels have. Even like an Oleg, who would, I can't think of a worse place for him to be from a style point of view. He's got a I base for, for him, these guys. I, I think for him to just experience that and see what it's like and see what they do and internalize it in whatever way he chooses to internalize it, there. It can't not be a benefit. Yeah, just um, just work a tag match. See what Volador Junior and Ultimo Guerrero do. Like, it's it's. I I always think that's um, it really stands out to me the way those guys work um, compared to almost everyone else in the world. It's very old fashioned, but it still works. Um, yeah. I we gotta start wrapping this up. But do you have comments? <laughs> yeah. I, we only got to two promotions. I thought we would get to more, but that's okay. Do you have anything else outstanding outside of all Japan and Japan that you want to bring up quickly? So I I gotta I gotta just talk a bit about Dragon Gate and just oh, good, say that Case was gonna get really uh, frustrated if he listened to this whole thing and we didn't get to Dragon <laughs> Gate. So so Dragon Gate, we spoke earlier about promotions having a youthful vibe and um and how that's been a struggle for Japanese wrestling. And when we talk about that, I think we're talking about all the quote-unquote traditional promotions and both by fans the media in japan especially um 
Dragon Gate is not considered a traditional promotion. Um, uh, it's it just it's viewed as its own thing, and it's disrespected in many ways um, over there uh, because of that. Um, it, it's funny. I think in the West, Dragon Gate is viewed as more among Western wrestling fans. Dragon Gate is viewed as more of a part of the Japanese wrestling scene than it actually is in Japan. Um, I think someone like Shingo is going to be great as he gets more of an influence. I think Shingo already has quite a bit of influence in terms of if he speaks, people listen um, in in Japan because he's so well respected and re well regarded. Um, but I think being a guy that came from the Dragon Gate system um, that is now somewhere else and excelling and has excelled for a number of years, I think he... I, I think he will be uh, someone that's very useful in, in kind of connecting Dragon Gate up, but ultimately how much Dragon Gate wants to be connected up to other promotions um, is, it's it's hard to know at different points in their history, they have been to different degrees. Um, they are a part of this uh, united uh, Japan pro wrestling, which we haven't spoke about this, but it's going to be an interesting thing to see throughout the year. There's a big show in Budokan, I think, at early May. Uh, All Japan, Big Japan, DDT, Dragon Gate, Gambare, New Japan, NOAA, Stardom, Tokyo Joshi Pro. So you basically have the Cyber Fight promotions, the Bushi Road promotions, All Japan, and Dragon Gate, right? So um, it's, it's essentially everyone is coming under this thing where they're working with the government, pooling resources, and they're going to have this big show. Um, in Budokan. Um, so D Dragon Gate is involved in that. I could have easily seen a situation where they weren't based on history and, and how they are kind of the outsider um, part of the industry. But they have always been um, a youth-oriented promotion. And their, their, their roots are as a promotion built around young early 20s wrestling that's how Toriumon started was everyone was in their early 20s that they were pushing all under the the watchful eye of Ultimo Dragon um and they are when we've spoken about the approaches of New Japan and other promotions today in terms of how they handle uh young guys bringing them through Dragon Gate has been um so the opposite in, in many ways in terms of just a having it's it starts at the very beginning because they when they go to recruit they have way less hurdles that you need to clear to be recruited than in new japan the height requirements the weight requirements all these things the uh, sporting requirements that you might have that you might need to get into a new Japan or an all Japan aren't there with Dragon Gate. Um, they'll take on anyone of any size and that allows them to get some guys who potentially might not um, be a big heavyweight star in a new Japan, but they're still potentially massively talented. And then what happens is when they do come in, even if it's even if you're bringing in more people and and, and less choosy in terms of who you bring in, the standard of the training historically is so high in Dragon Gate and the opportunities guys get to wrestle a lot and the busiest schedule in Japan with Dragon Gate. Um, it allows them to churn out guys who are at a really high level within a year or so. Like we spoke with Shota Umino still finding himself six years in. Dragon Gate have guys who debuted like a year ago who are like, they, they just, they have guys who within a year can become top line guys who know what they are, who have kind of great matches, who can be in main events. Um, it's happened right through the promotions history and they're always they're always um bringing more and more through and that dojo i believe is currently filled up with with guys right now and they're they're still bringing people through and yeah it's 
they're constantly restocking um they've got so many young talented guys um i think rather than going through guys individually um what i kind of wanted to highlight is a there's a really high skill level amongst their guys um but what i am increasingly are constantly kind of frustrated with is that i find that there is less of a not that they're less motivated but there's maybe less of an intensity about their motivation um an intensity in the way they present themselves than some of the younger guys of the past in dragon gate um people like doi and yoshino um shima when they were younger they just seemed like there just seemed to be a fire in their belly that some of the younger wrestlers in Dragon Gate don't really have at the moment. I think Case would probably disagree with me to an extent on that. Um, and I think we see flashes of it from some guys, sure. I think you could point to some examples from time to time, but on an overall sense, it's something I struggle with. Um, Do you think that's partially like just kind of a um... generational thing? Generally, but like a, I don't want to say like a numbness of the style, but I feel like when I first discovered Dragon Gate, Dragon Gate, we're talking about your Yoshinos and your Genki Horaguchis and your Doys. It was this really, really innovative style that we didn't see. Well, here's see. the thing: that style has proliferated the whole industry. So right, when we that's first my saw... that's my point, Alan. Yeah, which is I'm saying like the Dragon a... Gate's been the most influential wrestling on right. the so wrestling there's, industry there's not for... that kind of novelty of when you meet man you first saw when i first saw yoshino hit the ropes which would have been when they were doing the the x cup the world x cup in, in yeah impact in like 2008 it's like this guy is the greatest person i've ever seen at running the ropes holy shit he's going so fast and obviously like and it, it, there's just like when you first discover it, there's this whole like innovation and and amazing and now when if you've been watching the promotion for decades and that new generation hits, they they can be just as good fundamentally as the other guys. And I don't necessarily think it's a fire problem because I think a guy like Kakuda has shown a lot of fire. But there's a novelty aspect, I think. It's not to say the the the, the wrestling style hasn't evolved, um, because all wrestling styles evolved, but it just it feels like there's there's less of a, that specialness attracted to the product. It feels similar to um all the wrestling you see in other promotions across the world and that isn't the way it was 15 years ago i think the thing that separates them is that they have more they have more guys on their roster that are at that level doing that than most rosters in wrestling absolutely but it's not whereas before it was that but also it was nobody else is is doing this um so it's like if you watch AEW, you're gonna see um you're gonna see some stuff that is at such a high level that when you watch dragon gate you're probably not gonna see anything you haven't seen from six months of watching AEW. it's just it's got a really high bar in the sense that pretty much the whole card is going to have guys doing that um and that's that's where they're kind of exceptional they have such a high quality a high standard of work in that promotion it's a really high working standard in, in dragon gate but if you're just dipping in and watching a match here or there from dragon gate it's just going to be like dipping in watching hyped matches from anywhere else you're going to be yeah. watching a couple of great matches and they're not going to stand out in the way that jumping in and watching a Dragon Gate match in 2005 would have stood out or even geez especially in like 2002 2003 if you picked up like the first case road about the um the first three way trios trios match in 2001 and how utterly mind blowing that would have been to people in 2001 um 
Well, you can you just, just don't you, have you talk about the famous do fixer versus blood generation match in ROH in yeah. 2005, just of which course. was, uh, I don't say it was a fairly standard Dragon Gate six man, but it was very much in the style of the standard Dragon Gate six man. But a lot of people, even hardcore indie American fans had never seen that kind of wrestling before. And I think in general, this is a comment. I was, I was thinking about this last night. Like I was thinking about the, the podcast, um, and one of the things I was thinking about was, especially in all Japan and Noah over the last 10 years, um, not not nearly as much of a problem in Dragon Gate and not a problem really at all in New Japan, but in Noah and all Japan in particular, I think a major issue for them as a Western fan was that for the first time pretty much ever, the working standard in America was higher than the working standard in those Japanese promotions. And if that's the case, it's going to be harder for people to get, especially Western fans, to get invested in some of these pro promotions. When there's only a couple wrestlers in those promotions where you're like, oh, those guys are really good and I want to see them wrestle. When we have a we have AEW, but also when the Indies were still going and you had the UK Indies, and you would just you would see four star matches all the time in the United States. And I would flip on an All Japan show from 2016, and I might see one. Yeah, the main event might hit that level. Yeah, if, if you know, um, oh, I can't remember his name anymore. This is terrible. I don't even want Kento, to Kento Miyahara? No, no, <laughs> no, we're not talking about Kento. I'm talking about, um, it's weird because I can remember his name being uh, Chad Hosai, which is his real name. Um Oh, Aki Bono. Uh, Aki Aki Bono. Bono. <laughs> Couldn't remember Aki Bono. Like, yeah, but like, unless Aki Bono is in that main event, then it's not hitting four stars. Um, which when I first started watching All Japan, like on a regular basis, Aki Bono was the champion. Um, but so, so yeah, that I, and that's kind of a general problem I think I've had, and, and certainly with Noah now, I, I think no Noah's got some somewhat interesting younger guys, and they've they've got they've they've found some interesting imports. Um, that people didn't really expect them to go with. Um, but especially with Nakajima gone and, and some of the older guys slowing down, Kiyomiya kind of twisting in the wind. It, it, they, there's not a lot of guys in there that I'm super hyped to see wrestle. And it, when if that's not the case, I'm not going to find myself watching Noah all that much because I've got a lot of other wrestling I can watch with a really high standard. Noah in its DNA, for whatever reason, has a complete adversarial relationship with making young stars they refuse to do it they would rather shoot themselves in their own foot all day long than make a young star and push a never, Yoshiki, push, a, push Yo, someone who never drew at the top yoshiki inamura debuted in 2018 jesse he had his seven match trial series in 2019 okay all sounding pretty good so far guys showing promise um, big heavyweight Haas looks very good, has charisma Crowder into him Jesse we are now five years into his career, six years into his career and he has just been sent on excursion he's been sent on excursion to progress wrestling where he wrestles like one match a month what is going on why has he never won an N1 match? Why is that a thing they're proudly talking about on commentary? Like, Yoshiki Inamura is still looking for that first big N1 win. Like, what the hell? This guy could be GAT heavyweight champion by now. Why has Masa Kitamiya never been put over to a bigger degree? Why is he always on the losing end of every feud he's in? Why... That, look, we don't need to spend time on Kiyomiya Mudo. We've referred to it. Everyone knows the deal there. Um, they, But this goes back to, and this is why I use the term DNA, because it's like, as much as Noah's a new company than it was in the 2000s, in the 2000s, they couldn't make a new star for... Uh, all the uh, like they just weren't bringing guys through their dojo that was the problem then it was so hard to get through the noah dojo because i know they like kenta beat the shit out of everyone until they ran home in the middle of the night and escaped um so it's like 
and they also had really strict uh, uh, regulations on who could who who they would take on. Like they just weren't taking people on, and when they did, it was like they bullied them into breaking. And then if they actually made it through that, then they just were given a real inconsistent push. And uh, yeah, so Noah has always been a disaster for one reason or another with making young stars, and they continue to be. And that's why they've got guys who look like. They have tools like these new guys they have now. They've got size, they've got athletic ability, they've got fire um, by the looks of things. But I don't have any stock that these guys will amount to anything. Um, so yeah, until Noah proved me wrong on that, I'd be uh, I, I'm not I'm not gonna invest in them creating any new young stars. Uh, j- just back to Dragon Gate quickly what i will say what dragon gate need to do we spoke about them in terms of maybe the western point of view in terms of getting that attention from western fans i think what's more actually important to dragon gate is just building their relationship with their own fans and making some of these guys getting more some of these guys more over with their own fan base and that comes down to the booking how they um how they position these guys, the stories they tell with them. Um, Traditionally, they've been very good on that side of things. Where things have been difficult for them lately is that they've had a lot of bad luck with injuries and all kinds of different momentum killing things. Uh, They debuted a a guy who they were clearly rocket strapping after he came back from a year in in Mexico. uh, I forget his his actual um, uh, Nishikawa, uh, but they rebranded him TN Revolution, and uh, he was going to be uh, like they were going to make this guy something big, 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 and he got injured within the first month, and he's uh, I think it was torn ACL or something along those lines. So he is he's very much away now, but they have. Um, they have other young guys uh, that they that they have a lot of stock in. Uh, most oh, of the roster is very young. They are the, very, and they have always. They're the opposite of Noah, right? They're very, very good at, and even like New Japan could take a page out of their book in terms yep. of getting these guys up to the top of the card faster. And they really aggressively over the last two years or so have the class of guys, and they're saying these are our new top guys. Everyone else is kind of going to be pushed out a peg, and. But they've even uh, filled they've even filled out like the the mid card and like the undercard roles with young guys like your yeah. um like they have they have their like young guys future stars but they also have their young guys uh, ditch digger pin eaters like everyone in every role on the roster is there's or in every position on the roster there's youth whether it's opening match mid card heel face um like you've got your Ishin is like your grimy heel, uh, your new grimy heel, and he's young. You've got um, uh, Nagano as your underguard, um, baby face, uh, underdog flyer. You've got your um, uh, the, the kid is the Jr. Most... Oh, Mochizuki Jr. Well, that's so that's a real because I think Mochizuki Jr. has the potential to be the best wrestler in the world. Um, that's if he can stay injury free, which has been difficult for him so far, but he has, he has it, and a clear grasp of pro wrestling that no other young wrestler in the world has right now. If things work out, I think he'll be one of the best wrestlers in the world. He has that potential. He is phenomenal, and um, yeah, I I just. I, I really hope things work out for him because he is he is so much potential but they have so many guys and more to come apparently so um yeah and they've they even just... stumbled into like this whole luis monte formerly known as Di- diamante thing where his rise has really been just them kind of stumbled into him i think i think case told me that like he he was originally brought in because ultimo dragon needed somebody to base for him or something because like dragon was coming back to the company and he hadn't worked the dragon gate style in a while. And he basically needed somebody that had worked a lot in Mexico to work with him. 
Yeah, and so he was a connection from from Mexico. Yeah, so he was kind of like this bottom tier wrestler that they had, and he just slowly got over. Um, to the well, degree the that big, he... the big thing with him was that when the pandemic happened, and they had a couple of other guys from Mexico, uh, or at least one other that I remember. Um, but he, everyone else went home. Um, he they they gave him the opportunity to go home and no hard feelings or whatever. Um, but he was like, no, I want to stay. Um, mm-hmm. And he stayed with the company throughout the pandemic. And um, he doesn't seem to have learned the language a lick yet. Uh, but um, uh, promos are a real, real issue there. But that's a, a case and Mike have talked about that and, and opened the voice gate. It's not even the language. It's he doesn't seem to know what he's doing when he has a mic in his hand. It's a really awkward deal. And but it's he's like, real... yeah. My point was that he's kind of just like, in addition to the, these these younger classes of wrestlers they put in here, they just kind of found him and were able to kind of consistently to- push him total up bonus. the card. Yeah, total um, bonus. It's a um, bonus, but it's also a reflection of like an open mindedness and ability yeah. to notice when someone's getting over and being able to successfully elevate them so that the fans can kind of take them seriously. And whether he's a huge draw or not, he's way more valuable than he was, you know, three or four years ago when he first came to the company. Yeah. Dragon um, Gate have never fought their fans. If their fans latch on to something, they will give them more of it. If their fans turn against something, they will strange stop philosophy to have for a wrestling company. Yeah. But, um, uh yeah no they just uh i do have concerns about how into the product their fans are um sometimes it's i the the fan base is le- like when you watch an all japan show in 2023 the crowd seems really into the product like vocally into the product most dragon gate shows you don't get that and i don't know if that's a reflection of the guys not being over or just the makeup of the fans in terms of maybe they're more they get more reserved people going to the shows who it doesn't feel like um it just could be like an environment thing but like if you're in an environment where everyone's quite reserved like it's going to feel le- you're going to be less inclined to um just be very vocal you're gonna kind of be like everyone else you know whereas if you're in an environment where everyone's screaming and shouting then you're gonna let rip and scream and shout with everyone else and i i want to see dragon gate get back to because it has its history of playing in front of these crowds that were rabid and noisy and excited and like that's what i i would love to see again um and I, i i hope that just the right stars in the right position will allow them to achieve that. It's really glaring when they go to the bigger buildings for their, um, for their big shows their five or six big shows every year. Um, Those things can be a bit cavernous and if they maybe haven't drawn as well, and then it's this kind of reserved quieter crowd, the shows can be a tough watch. Even, even if the wrestling belt bell is really well executed it can be tough. Um, Corican is better. You've got you've got the Tokyo fans in there, but even still, it's not always it's not always amazing. It's not always a home run. Um, some of the smaller venues can be good from time to time, but other times not. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I I it's something I'd like to see uh, improve in twenty twenty four for Dragon Gate and. Um, yeah, but uh, developing young talent is is not their issue um, at all. They are extremely good at it, and they have a lot of guys that there's reason to be very, very hopeful with right now. Honestly, I think their biggest issue is like the hardest thing to do in wrestling, which is to take somebody who's over and talented and really be able to elevate them into their in that that very rare level where they're like a money drawing star. And there's not that many guys in the industry that are like that, and it's super duper difficult. But I feel like they have a lot of candidates, but they haven't gotten that one guy or those two guys over it. And, and Dragon Gate historically has been more of a collective approach than an individual star. But I think that's kind of um, missing, where I don't feel like they have that Kento Miyahara-like wrestler. Yeah, it's like they um, 
the thing with Dragon Gate is that there's always been um, all the different wrestlers have like their own fan bases. And mm-hmm. it's like if so, if like a wrestler like it gets injured or leaves the company, it's like their fans stop going. Um, yeah, or like, like who would you them. even say right now on the Dragon Gate roster? And I'm sure Case or Mike would be a better would would know a, a more detailed answer. But like, who would you say right now, Dragon Gate roster, most popular wrestler, like the top guy in the company, if you had to pick one? Hyo, Hyo, and uh, Hyo and uh, Luis Monte as as Big Hug seem to be the. The most popular guys right now um especially you'd say they're ahead of shun skywalker in terms of just overall presence on the show uh in terms of presence currently they're right there with them because they're kind of involved with him um Mm -hmm. uh in story shun has got more of a track record as a top guy but shun is there's not i don't think there's really shun fans because he's such an ingrained heel now and he's so Mm -hmm. he is the villain of the story in that company um uh yeah so and he kind of plays this psychopath character which um yeah it i i think just in terms like if you look at the the merch and the crowd and they've obviously they've the benefit of being new this uh, big hug and their new merch and uh um it's very but i've been very um i've been very impressed by what we've seen from hyo since he turned face um he he really has taken he's really hit the ground running and the, i'm a hyo the... fan i like him and i've always when that whole group debuted he was the one that actually stood out the most to me just that i mean he had rookies? an athleticism to him yeah but that oh, whole... he's, a super, he's a super athlete and yeah and case wrote he... not to not to bury case here because case obviously does an amazing job but he was writing about the uh the hyo versus genki horaguchi match from uh final gate and he was saying how there, you know, Hyo could be like, is kind of like a, a new Genki Horaguchi. And he's one of the things he said was he's like, you know, Genki has that sneaky athleticism and Hyo has that sneaky athleticism. And I'm like, Hyo doesn't have sneaky athleticism. The guy like debuted doing like 200 flips in a row. I think Hyo is, especially was really thinking it this week watching the Korokin show. I think Hyo is turning into Masato Yoshino. Um, yeah, that's closer to him, but obviously Case is right. I'm wrong. I'm not even going to debate. <laughs> <laughs> I I think. What about Gianni got... Valletta? You think he's a top guy in the company? I love that Gianni Valletta. Um. Uh. Oh God, I forget the kid's name. Um. To the the kid whose gimmick is that he's a Cork and Hall staff member. Uh, um, Yanaguchi. 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 Daiki, yeah, Yana, Daiki, yeah. Um. It, it's so funny. I never forget these names like in my head or whatever, but as soon as I start saying them out loud, I'm like, oh, what's his name? Um, I have not. But, so I'm going to say I have not seen Gianni Valletta yet, but I've, I've been, you know, I click on the cards on Cage Match every day and I've seen that his name has popped up for Dragon Gate. And I was like, that is someone I did not expect to be working Dragon Gate. It was so funny watching him do his whole Bruiser Brody entrance, which like works when it's like 1984 and you've got bands just scattering everywhere and going crazy he was doing this and just a lot of confused quiet demure fans in the crowd just looking at him just being like what is this and not moving and and so basically he goes around and they just have these like two young like trainee kids who like have never debuted or whatever they're just going around chasing him and he'll stop and beat them up and then he'll he'll run around a bit and then they'll catch up with him again and he'll stop and beat them up he must have beat up each of these kids about 10 times each and they kept on by the end of this thing these kids looked like superman because they'd keep getting back up and no selling the beatings he was giving them so they could like have more time to take the night by taking the next beating it was hilarious but then he, he comes been... into the ring and he destroys Yanaguchi in uh uh oh my god it was it he, was so something else. i'm just looking at his cage match now he hasn't been in japan since before the pandemic oh really um, wow he's been okay. work, it looks like he's been working in mexico um like his most featured promotion is iwrg and he's been you know in in europe obviously because he's uh european based um but I, you know, I saw him a lot in all Japan when he was a regular in all Japan pre-pandemic, and I kind of haven't thought about him that much. 
And then I just saw him and I was like, wait a minute, Gian- Gianni Paletto, what on earth is he doing on those Dragon Gate shows? But he's worked, I think, every show this year so far or close to it. So, Oh, no, no. He just debuted on the, well, oh, sorry, this year. Yeah, 2024. Yeah. Yeah, gonna, you're right. Sorry. Yeah, like he's, he's, you know, so I don't know if he's, he's you know, if they're having him win squash matches, that means he's going to be doing something. It's just, it's it was <laughs> very strange, yeah. Um, but uh, I, I, we got to wrap this up. This is this is getting outrageous. Um, uh, I just want to point out, like, uh, I I don't really watch Joshi or have any opinions on Joshi whatsoever. So yeah, that's I'm, why we I'm didn't. Not the, I'm not the man to. Uh, yeah, so that's why we didn't I cover don't. it. And I'm sorry I, if I you... tried. I tried with Stardom um, about a year or two ago, and I lasted a couple of months, and then I was like, oh, it's not, it's not clicking with me. I'm sorry. I, I watch. I watch the man. I wa- I watch matches when they get a lot of praise and I start seeing, you know, match of the year contender stuff. And I'll, I'll go out and try to watch those matches in the respective Joshi promotions, but I don't have any, any thoughts on, um, you know, long-term booking and, and things like that, that I would have for the promotions that we did and discuss today. There's so, so I, I, many, there seems to be so many young wrestlers and it's a, it's a good thing, but it's like, if you're, if you're not, if you're not following it, um, if you're like at a distance from it, like I am, it's like I, I just am constantly seeing new names, and I'm like, yeah, it's okay, like an alphabet who's... soup kind of thing where it's just like new names rearranged, and then people tell you this person's definitely got to be rookie of the year, and they're like, oh, but this person's been the best debut of this year, and it's like, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm sure they are, but it just, it's just, too, I have a finite amount of period of time that I can commit to to watching wrestling and it's it's really difficult to watch even a lot of the promotions that we discussed today i'm very much a casual fan of outside of new japan i i'm not watching all, every cork on hall show for for all japan and uh all japan to be fair is relatively easy to keep track of because they really haven't run that many dates like dragon gate runs well over 100 dates a year but all japan i think ran like under 50 dates last year maybe they did more because um but all Japan is a relatively easy to keep track of. And, and most shows you only need to see. Like I try to watch the full cork and shows, but like on the other shows, um, and and the big shows as well. But like any other shows I watch, like I might just be picking the main event or maybe yeah, main it's, event. It's, is... it's not a particularly fast moving promotion in terms of storyline development. Um which helps makes it easier to follow, especially if you're you know, trying to catch up. Yeah, like I could probably tell you the story of All Japan's 2023 in like uh, six sentences. Like this happened, and this happened, and this happened, and this happened. Whereas, like, if I tried to do that for New Japan, it'd be like, well, okay, so this happened in the US, and then they did the best Super Juniors tour, and then they came back. It'd be like, it just, yeah, it, it's so, there's so much more going on in a New Japan or even a Dragon Gate where it's like, things are changing constantly with all japan it was very clear simple booking slow paced but not never felt like it wasn't moving fast enough it was no just, if anything yeah. it they did they, they did some of the most progressive booking they've done in a very long time yeah um it's just that they're not necessarily like it's not an endless stream of stories and new new people arriving and there's there's a relatively sm- it's a much smaller core roster Everything um, has a chance to breathe. Yeah. Uh, Alan, would you like to plug anything? Uh, I feel I should. I feel I should just stop here because I've taken up enough of everyone's time. Oh, my God, Jesse, you, you you got me going. I made the mistake of having a coffee before we started, and then I was all fired up. So yeah. um, if you've made it through this whole thing, uh, listening to me ramble, um, I greatly appreciate it. And if you, if you want to hear more of me rambling, uh, I have my own show. Uh, the Pro Rest Paradise over at PW Torch VIP. Um, Jesse was a guest on our uh, What's on the Telly series. So I have a couple of sort of mini series that I do within the overall Pro Rest Paradise show. And one of them is What's on the Telly, where we review um, two episodes of that period in two episodes of wrestling TV and that period of wrestling history um so uh like when jesse came on it was november so we did like a ecw 1995 november 95 show around november to remember and we did a um what was the other pick we did we jesse, watched tna we did, oh, tna uh that we was watched your the pick. end of the aces and eights angle 
Yes, we did. We got uh, more Bully Ray, the man that plagued me throughout uh, the What's on the Telly series, being on seemingly every month. Uh, but um, yeah, so we that we was picked... honestly that was the best. It was the best when I watched them back to back, and Bully Ray was all over the Impact episode. And then I was like, all right, wow, that was a lot of Bully Ray. And then I booted up the ECW episode, <laughs> and fucking Bully Ray is the first person on the screen. <laughs> Dancing Bubba Ray, the your host for the evening. But uh, yeah. Um, so just yeah a a variety of things on the podcast we discuss wrestling past present uh from different parts of the world it's um yeah whatever strikes me as an interesting thing to talk about uh um along with kind of our consistent mini series uh so yeah that's a um that's my main thing really uh fsm 50 is going to be coming out um on voice of wrestling in the next couple days and my next pro rest paradise will um feature discussion about that with some of the the members of the fsm 50 voting panel so um yeah that's the plugs for me i would say alan 4l on twitter but i'm basically just using twitter now just to put up my shows so um if you want to chat to me i probably on the voice of wrestling discord is probably the place you'll find me uh find me most all right i want to thank alan for being on the show i want to thank all the listeners who continue to tune into this product um Appreciate all the kind words that people have said. Got a lot of good feedback for our most previous, uh, most recent episode um, with Chris Ely talking about the kind of demographic differences between uh, AEW and WWE. Um, thanks for everyone who who's left a positive review. I'm told that's very important for the algorithms is to, to leave a, a positive review uh, of this podcast on whatever podcast outlet you're getting it from. So I appreciate all those. Um, so thanks a lot. And we'll talk to you again after a while. Do you like wrestling trivia? Then check out the five-star match game, the Pro Wrestling Quiz Show. I'm Joe Gagne, and every episode, I grill three contestants with five rounds of power-packed wrestling trivia. We have over 30 evergreen episodes in the archives covering WWE, AEW, Japan, Mexico, and much, 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 much more. Play along at home and check it out today.